Welcome everybody. Welcome to Go Global World GGW Sharks. And uh, this is a global pitch event that we do every single week. And this is unlike any other event because we are inviting selected investors that are actively investing in startups here right in front of you to judge your projects. And you are the ones who convince them to uh, invest in you. Of course, this is two minute elevator pitch will not bring you a check right away, but you can grab attention of these investors and maybe others will watch it to uh, have a separate call, separate conversation to further invest in you. Because mm -hmm. Global World is um, a sponsor mm -hmm. and organizer of this event, I will show you a few slides, what we do, why we do it, and uh, then I will kick off the session. And afterwards, uh, the floor will be yours and the Sharks, and uh, we will rock today's session. This is the final session of this year. I'm super excited to see so many brilliant, talented people around the world. And I saw the map of your from your registrations. This is crazy. It's really around the world. Welcome to uh, Go Global World Ecosystem. Uh, uh, why we exist and what we do. We're building digital Silicon Valley ecosystem for global founders, investors, and advisors. Because I don't believe that you need to be right in Silicon Valley to build uh, and scale your global companies. Uh, you can do it from anywhere. And uh, here we help you with access to knowledge of how to start a growing company, access to network of founders and investors, and access to opportunities to raise capital like today. This is the time when you have a chance to meet investors and convince them to write you a check. Uh, and you will have uh, two minutes for that. Uh, as the founder, you have access uh, to our platform. You can subscribe on any plan. Starter, you'll give access uh, to basic uh, things of our platform, or you can accelerate your growth and access to the entire platform we have. Uh, so just take a look at our plans and some of the plans may fit you uh, your company acceleration. This is the dashboard that will help you uh, with managing your company and getting access to the resources from around the world we, will, we have prepared for you. Um, and uh, we have another pitch uh, program, which is called Pitch to Global Investors. This is where we pre-select startups, we screen and score. We have a team in place uh, to actually select every single company uh, or decline with some reasons. And this is a, a, at the moment free of charge and uh, program only for members. However, uh, the selection process here is uh, quite uh, tough. So I, I encourage everyone to apply. And uh, the existing event is the pre-selection for this uh, pitch program. So most of you might be accepted to the pitch program uh, and uh, we can later connect to you, but make sure to apply it on our website so we know that you're interested to participate. Uh, this is our global investor. Just where is a quick snapshot of how we have lots more investors and these are the guys who will invest if they find an interesting company uh, of yours and um, uh, meeting their investment criteria. Uh, this is our advisors and uh, those are people who will advise you and challenge your company before you meet the investor. So you will come prepared. This is important. These are the perks you get on our platform and uh, uh, this is uh, the uh, opportunity for those who are raising, get some access to the uh, uh, latest technology to use them for acceleration of your business. And here we negotiated with these companies, huge deals like HubSpot 90%, like uh, Xero, like many others. These are the companies that uh, you need to use anyway and we give you huge discounts. This is specifically for Go Global World members. And uh, the new uh, agreement we recently signed with Brex, uh, they give you up to $600 in bonus and uh, zero to accelerate your accounting and automate your accounting, 50% off for your fifth, six months subscription with annual subscription and uh, way a lot more. Uh, the other is important that access to knowledge on our YouTube channel and uh, our website, we give you access to the best speakers we pre-select from around the world and they talk not to inspire you but give you access to steps how to do something uh, to build your companies and those who are uh, right now uh, already in the mode of uh, grow, building and growing their company they probably need to incorporate file taxes uh, do accounting and a lot more we are there to help we are doing this uh, with many companies and we are happy to be one of your providers on these services as well so just let us know Connect with Lachesar, me, or just email us. We'll be happy to sit there to help you. 
And uh, this is the bonus I'm gonna give uh, right now to you. We just published another video on YouTube channel because this is the end of the year and you're wondering like how to properly report your expenses to write off legally as much taxes as possible so you can reinvest it in your business. So this is the uh, answer. So go now YouTube channel after this event and just uh, watch it. It's a very short video with uh, important steps you need to do. And this, this is another video we prepared, how to file taxes yourself. If you don't have enough money to afford a tax accountant, a tax advisor, or a CPA, this is the algorithm of steps you need to do very detailed so you can file your taxes yourself. Of course, you need to be careful with that. And uh, another, another announcement I have is that we are launching a new product, uh, a Tinder match, uh, I would call it like this, uh, uh, we call it GW match uh, between investor and a startup. And uh, we are inviting first beta uh, users who wants to try our solution free of charge. Uh, so you would be the first uh, of the, in the world to see this technology and connect with probably with the right investors. Now, that's it on this part. Uh, I'm happy to announce and kick off our final session of the year. And uh, this event became a really big deal in uh, uh, startup world, in my opinion, though we just started recently. And uh, this is GGW Sharks pitch event for startups to pitch investors uh, with, within two minutes. So it's important that you don't use slides and uh, this is the opportunity to grab attention of investors, get uh, uh, your questions and feedback and answer them. So this is your opportunity. Who is participating today? This is a big deal, right? So we see real uh, uh, great uh, investors from uh, all parts of the world and here today with me, uh, Zamir Shukho, Fibranium VC, and Angelica Maroon will participate probably later. Um, as uh, uh, Jordan Wab Wabek, SV Venture, uh, Venture Group, uh, Yuan uh, Hyper uh, uh, from Hyper Therm Ventures, and Duran Davis, uh, uh, m, m d Ventures. Uh, some of these uh, investors already participated, some just first time participating. So I'm welcoming the investors. Uh, and before we begin, there are simple rules I want everyone to uh, uh, follow. That's important. Uh, so we have this event uh, very efficient and fast. Uh, please keep yourself muted all the time. Raise your hand if you want to pitch. We will go in the order. We will have uh, only two hours for the event. And uh, you will have two minutes uh, for your elevator pitch. You will not use slides. Please do not use slides. And respect time. You have two minutes. Be in two minutes, uh, no more time for any, uh, any of your pitch. And then you will just uh, get questions from the investors, answer this, get feedback. Uh, we are there not only challenge you, but also to help you. Uh, and so just respect that too. So uh, the final thing and the reward for you, of course, you can re uh, exchange your connections uh, in the chat, network, help out each other. Just don't sell anything to yourself. Just be of help to each other. That's important. And the final slide I want to show you, this is the guy uh, who will coordinate uh, the show, um, Lachizar Zanif. Uh, Hello, everyone. Uh, he's a GDW moderator, and he's the one who will be moderating today. And uh, the, con the main contact, you want to reach out uh, on any questions about GoGoBo World. Uh, if you want to become a member, uh, you want to subscribe uh, to our pl pricing plans, or you just want to be in our network, he will coordinate give you the best advice uh, how you can do it. Now, that's it on my end, and I'm uh, welcoming everyone. We are ready to start. Lechizar, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much for the great introduction. And I would like to um, to say a few wor good words about uh, Go Global World. Thank you very much for uh, organizing this. Actually, I've been very involved in, uh, in organizing the event also, and uh, it will be a great event. So let's start with a few of our members we'll give priority to. Uh, and we will start with Maxim Nagotkov. Ma are you here, Maxim? Yes, I'm here. Do you see me? Okay. Hear me? Uh, I think so, yeah. Yes, your turn. Uh, okay, so hi, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Maxim Nagotkov. So I live in Miami and I'm CEO and co founder of uh, Terra Terra. So this is a community powered fashion platform. So, and I have more than 20 years of experience as an entrepreneur in retail and fintech and built uh, companies with like 30,000 people working 2 billion uh, in equity value. And yeah, I, I'm very excited about uh, creator economy and 
today more and more people like both uh, fashion designers and influencers uh, they want to be independent and they want to create and sell the authentic physical fashion products uh, but it's harder than ever to start their business and to be successful in the fashion industry so more than 70 percent of fashion projects these days uh, they destroy shareholder value uh, and the reasons for this are several. So first of all, it's very hard to create a community. On Instagram, people see only 20% of your posts. Uh, so you, you don't have consistency in communication with, with your fans. It's very hard to get funded because venture funds, they don't like to take risks on creatives and they don't like to finance lifestyle businesses which are rarely scalable. And it's very expensive to sell uh, through marketplaces and department stores. So fashion designers pay up to 60% for distribution to, to be present at places like Name and Marcus, for example. And we see the solution in uh, creating community from day one and transfer the money a fashion designer spent for marketing and advertising into community building. So we, we create this, so we see the solution in engaging and getting support from their super fans. So 5% of their audience, which makes around 35% of their revenue. So we're building social e-commerce platforms, so which gives all the necessary tools to, for engagement and support. So fashion designers and influencers can co-create with their, with their super fans. They can share future revenue. They can launch early pre-sales and uh, effectively operate with manufacturing like on demand so they can reduce uh, the risks of manufacturing, the things which are not needed or returned, uh, and they and of course you, they can get. I seem sorry for interrupting. Can you wrap up? We are almost out of time. Okay. Yeah, we take around fourteen percent uh, commission from revenue for products created and funded on our platform. So our go-to-market strategy is very close to Patreon. So we we don't use money for marketing. We just bring the audience from existing social media platform. So we are in private beta now. Work with ten designers raising 3 million through saves. That's it. Okay, thank you. Any questions from our sharks? A comment, if I could. Uh, and unfortunately, he was the first to go, so we didn't really get a whole set of what he's trying to do. It was very slow to start. Uh, I heard a lot of negative tones in the presentation. I would encourage you to start positive. Tell us about the opportunity. And just frankly, you seemed a little tired, a little run down. So that's not the best way to, to get your uh, business going with investors. At this point, I don't know what you do. So that, that, was, that was the pitch, one of the pitches. When you said you get priority to a few guests, I, I thought that that was just a, a, a person joining. That was actually a presentation, like a pitch? Yes, yes sir, it was. Oh, yeah. I, I have no idea what, what the company is, like, like at all. Wait a second. I have a yeah, question. Yeah, listen. So, 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 yeah. So, so, just a few suggestions. One, really quick. Hold on one second. So, uh, uh, people, founders are passionate about their companies. I get it. They sit down, they do a lot of research. It's ideal for you to be the smartest person in the world about your idea. That's going to warrant the investment. But it's best to communicate as if you're talking to a two year old. Here's what we do. Here's why we do it. Here's the team that's going to pull it off. Here's how we anticipate making money. Here are the milestones that we had to get to that place. Your thoughts. Because I, I literally was like toned out because I, I thought you were given an intro as a person that's a guest, but turns out that you're one of the presenters. And, and I, I couldn't really understand succinctly of, of your business. It says nothing to your intelligence. In fact, I think your intelligence is probably the barrier between you actually communicating in a fashion where we can actually draft your, draft your idea. Okay, I think we should move to our next presenter. Uh, no, uh, wait, 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 yeah. wait a second. Okay. Please let let uh, Maxim answer. Uh, please let Maxim answer. Uh, Maxim, okay. can you, can you uh, comment on that, please? Uh, Daniel, I, I think uh, nothing to comment here. So, uh, so if it's not clear from from what I from what I'm talking about. Uh, no, uh, yeah, I should, I should, I should just work on this, and that's that's it. So I just, I just accept the comments. Okay, thank you. But I have a question uh, related to your audience. You said uh, that uh, you have a research about your audience uh, in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of uh, 
uh, the value you want to provide. But what are, what is your audience is saying? Like, or did you do customer interviews? Uh, did you talk to your audience? What are they saying about uh, getting this time, kind of solution for them? So can you tell us not from the research standpoint, but from what customers are saying? Uh, so our customers, so customers, uh, fashion designers, they they need this solution. And so like 100% of designers we speak to, they understand this. Uh, so they want to work with us. So so we have no issues to explaining what we do for to fashion designers, for, to people in the industry. Uh, so they face these problems every day. Uh, and they are desperate to find new ways to sell and promote themselves. And so we, we offer um, a new way um, to promote themselves and get funded. Okay, my but, final but question. Another... Go ahead. Um... So, uh, yeah, I was just wondering, because another, another part of your customer, uh, not, not necessarily the direct customers, but new, you know, the users that are like, you know, consumers that are looking for fashion tips and things to buy, right? Like, so those are also part of your platform that you need to, uh, you know, attract people you know, towards, right? Like, so how, how, how are you going toward like attracting users to kind of get on your platform overall? Yeah, we, um, we have different uh, external research, like 44% of uh, Gen Z, they want to co-create so they want to be closer to designers, to creators. Uh, so we, um, with other side of the platform, with super fans, we just have examples of fashion brands working with this audience. And we have research about how many people want to participate. So people want to be at the tech stage of the theater. And so they want to be close to creators and they want to brag about their contact with designers and that they do something together with the designers. All right. Uh, then okay. before we, before we move to the part, the next speaker, I have a final question. Just uh, it's important to ask: Why is your team the right uh, the right fit for for this project? Uh, because I I worked uh, I, I built Pandora jewelry business from scratch to eighty million in GBD in just three years. Uh, so I ran a team of thirty thousand people. I worked for a couple of years with fashion designer in the US. Uh, building building marketing solutions and his website and everything for him from scratch. So I have some experience to say a very, yeah, so. Okay. I think, that, yeah, I think definitely we should move right now to the next one because uh, many people want to pitch. Uh, and we are going with uh, David Abayev. David, are you here? David Abayev. Yes, hello. Okay, thank you, join. Your turn. Hi, everyone. Uh, can you see me? Yes, we can see you. Wonderful. Uh, there's no presentations, no pitch decks, right? It's just yes. pure. Yes. Wonderful. OK. Uh, it's really nice to meet everyone. Uh, I'm David. I'm the CEO of databar.ai. And uh, Daniel and I have been friends for a while. And first of all, I want to thank you guys for taking the time today and for, for joining. Um, so I'd like to share with you how we at Databar are giving APIs a new life in the no-code market. Um, but before I get into that, I want to share a bit about the problem. So if you're in the market for an external data set, you essentially have three options. Uh, you can rely on free or low-cost uh, marketplaces, which can be unreliable. You pay a ton of money to a specialized data provider, which can cost upwards of $5,000 a month. Or you can get technical. You can write your own web scrapers. Uh, which is time consuming. And even after you found your data set, it can take three to four hours, uh, sometimes even days to clean it. And if you want to stream or schedule data polls and enrichments, it's almost impossible without technical expertise. So my co-founder and I came across this issue uh, a lot and uh, we decided to solve it. And our solution is databar.ai, which is a no-code uh, marketplace for APIs which allows you to A, acquire data sets, uh, run enrichments on top of the data that you have, and three, also analyze external data sets and integrate them into your workflows. And the way it works is you log in, you pick an API you want to query, you query it in two clicks, run live auto-updating enrichments on top of it if you'd like to, 
and then integrated via our SDK uh, and pre-built uh, connectors. So we launched our product in January of 2022 uh, on Product Hunt. Uh, we're featured as one of the top products of the day, and we've been iterating, growing organically ever since. Uh, our retention, most importantly, uh, the people who use our platform love it. Uh, so we have a retention of around 60% after uh, two and a half months of usage. Um, and right now we're starting to actually monetize those users and roll out paid plans. Uh, we just rolled out our first uh, annual plan this week and, and have our first com customers already paying and using the platform. So the way we're going about growing this platform- Can you wrap up? Uh, Can you wrap up? We're almost out of time. Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay, uh, so we estimate the market at $109 million and we think we have the best team to do it. Uh, my background's in finance and data science. I've worked at VC funds in Europe and the US, including Altair Capital, TSG, Home Capital. My co-founder is a seasoned uh, data scientist who's worked at Alpha Bank, Rambler, uh, Improvado, and built high-low data pipelines at some of the largest companies in the world. We're also backed by Mucker Capital and some high-profile angel investors. and. Um, thank you for your time. I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Okay, thank you. Any questions from our sharks? Yeah, so now you mentioned about the API. The, the, the platform that you're building, you said something about, <clears throat> pardon me, you said something about no code, but, but how does it work as far as the, 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 the core code base that the team is working with in conjunction to the API. So even if you saw the issue regarding being able to interact with the API at the level where there's a lot of complexities, how do you ensure that the API integration with the proprietary code on the initial platform is going to have a good connection flow? Yeah, so uh, that's a good question. And that really digs directly at our job, uh, which is we've built this proprietary software that can connect to virtually any API in the world, uh, which is actually quite a difficult task because each API has its own specifications, documentation, structures, and we can, at this point, handle anything from async uh, to various formats, GraphQL, OAuth authorization, different types of pagination, you know, all of these kind of technical details that go into connecting to APIs. Um, and the beautiful thing about this is that we've done all of the plumbing behind uh, in the background. So our users don't need to care about any of those technical details. It's really just plug and play. Um, the same way Stripe lets you accept payments in one day, we can let you connect to any API in five minutes. Yes. Yeah, so, so my question is, and then I'm, I'm going to parse another part of this question so I can get more clarity. And my second question is going to be asking about the different layers, the partner APIs, internal APIs, open APIs, and composite APIs. I want to know exactly how you guys sit there. But as far as the next part to the first question, okay, so I get it what your solution is. But again, if I have a YouTube API that allows me to stream the video on a particular interface, that yeah. doesn't solve the problem if my engineers are having issues with our code base interacting with the API itself. In addition to the fact that YouTube may uh, cut off some calls inside of the API, whereby if they do that, even if we successfully mix our code with their API, it's going to fucking stop until we get in contact with, you, with, with YouTube. So that's two issues that I'm not really seeing. How do you internally know when you don't have access to our internal code that the API solution you provided is going to work? And what happens when YouTube ha have cut off certain access points to that particular API? Yeah, so... That's a good question. I think we need to frame this uh, specifically within the value add that we're providing. We're focused specifically on data APIs. So those are APIs that provide you with data sets, let's say web scraping, company data, think Zoom Info, Clearbit, uh, Lusha, those kinds of APIs that provide you specific data sets. And the way we work with them, so there's the API connector side. We partner with those APIs directly. We have over 100 partnerships set up. So essentially when you query, let's say uh, Diffbot on our platform, that's a data provider, you don't have to actually go and get a API key from them. We manage that relationship with Diffbot. So we ensure that nothing gets disconnected. Um, it's all pre-baked into our pricing system. So uh, that's your selling point there. That's where you start. So you, you have your secret sauce is the fact that you're going directly to these partners where you have access to them and you cut off the problem that the communication of the API, because again, that happens a lot. 
when the engineer is like, hey, there's nothing we can do. There's a problem with this API. We contacted this company, but we're just waiting on them to update it. And then thereby our code is going to be updated. But you already have that access with a partnership. So that's the part that needs to probably be in front of your presentation. And granted, you have short time here, but that's the beauty of having short time where you can find how to piece your presentation together to where we get it up front. But I, I understand now. Sure. Thanks. Okay, yeah. I think that we should move to the next one because we have many uh -huh. presenters today. Uh, and uh, we're going to move with Pablo Valento. Pablo, are you here? Um, yes, yes, hello. Hello, uh, is yours. Yeah, thank you. Hey, uh, I'm Pablo Valento. I'm founder of a new startup of this year. It is Andre Robot Deals. I have more than 20 years experience in creating and starting uh, IT services and platforms and different business domains. And now I started uh, Angry Robot Deals is a analytical platform for stock, currency, and crypto market. And uh, it is a marketplace of ready-made robots and as well as a provider of market uh, prediction and signals. It is a B2B standalone business solution and uh, B2B2C SaaS platform and uh, B2C platform for independent marketing of our analytical solutions. It is high load, uh, real time, and machine learning. It is a unicorn of 2024. Uh, so um, through the personal account or through the API clients uh, uh, receive signals and manage their capital. Um, the, the server part is already works well. Uh, there's uh, more than 20 data processing servers, uh, feeders, REST API, trading robots, um, and um, signal, signals and predictions um, are calculated uh, using technical analysis tools and self-developed machine learning model. Uh, we have a uh, large uh, interesting roadmap. Uh, we're building an uh, international community, uh, game mechanics, uh, integrations with more than uh, 200 international exchanges and major brokers. I prepare uh, Angry Robot Deal for fundraising in 2023. Uh, and I'm looking uh, for a marketing co-founder and the relevant investors. Please uh, connect me on LinkedIn and follow our updates on our site. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much too. Uh, any, any questions from the uh, panel? Uh, yeah, Pavel, hi. So do you guys have any revenues at this moment? Um, it is uh, $20,000. Uh, is it is it monthly recurred revenue or just overall? Oh, oh pardon. <laughs> it, it it was my own uh, funds uh, in my startup. Uh, no, I have no revenue. Uh, it's it is a new uh, platform. I just uh, created my uh, my website and uh, okay. clients. So accounts. when do you? Yes. So for the sake of time, when do you project to start having revenue from this? Uh, in March of twenty twenty three. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, I think that we should move to the next one, which is Tripti Verma. Tripti, are you here? Tripti, you're muted if you are speaking. I think that if, if not, we will move to the next one, uh, which is John Eren, John, are you here? John, you're muted if you are, yeah. are, are in the room. Can you hear me? Go. It's your turn. Yes. Yeah, okay. And please keep it to, up until two minutes. So go for it. Okay, hi everyone. My name is John. I am an independent uh, film producer, and I am developing a, a film streaming startup in Paris, Station F Campus. So our project is called Chainy TV. So Chainy TV is a, a creator economy platform uh, based on consensus, blockchain consensus. We have some uh, blockchain solution to uh, to make some alternative foundation for independent filmmakers such as nft based uh, crowdfunding and utility nft collections for uh, film project and for artists 
uh, we develop our project and we launch it two months before. So we have NF, uh, MVP tractions. And now we are working on our uh, token fundraising grant. And after that, we will start our scale up process. We have some international film festival partners. We have some uh, art school partners. And also we have some film distributors uh, in Europe and also in United States. So uh, our plan is we will invite independent filmmakers to our platform to build their uh, creator economy uh, models with our NFT solution. So this is our main uh, focus, main business model. And also uh, we will use our native token to support our uh, filmmakers, to support our audience. So we have a, a two a subscription model. One is free and one is payment based. So the payment based subscription model is based on our native token. So it is also our native tokens liquidity pool model. So all subscriptions, uh, subscribers will support our native tokens liquidity pool. So this is our uh, project. This is our business model. So if you have a question, I will be glad to uh, answer it. Thank you. Okay, thank you for adhering to the rule. <laughs> we have any questions from our panel? We can yeah, also leave, do you... yeah, go for it. Okay, this is, this is Duran. Are, are, you, are you guys licensing out any films from the six big film studios, specifically here in Los Angeles? So we don't have film studio connections. So we are focusing on independent filmmakers first, uh, because of the uh, you know because of the budget things. So we don't have uh, film studio connections right now, but in the near future, yes, we can make collaboration with film studios. Yeah. So so the reason, the reason, the reason is going to be like uh, like really quick chop, really quick questions, really quick answers. So the reason I asked the question because is your if your platform is a consumer platform. What I found with the streaming platforms, because we, we went through this a lot of, of years ago with services like Spotify or Netflix, the user growth is directly incumbent or connected to the amount of content that you have. <clears throat> Pardon me. So I, I see a lot of people say, hey, we're going to build a blockchain based music service. I say, yeah, that's fine. But when Beyonce new album come out, people are going to go to Spotify or Apple Music because that's where the album is. Yeah. So like, how are you guys really, how are, how are you guys considering your user growth? with a very limited amount of films, even if you have some of the best independent films in the world? Yeah, yeah, this is a good question. So our main focus is not, so yeah, it is a film streaming platform, but our main focus is uh, utility-based NFTs. This is very important for us. So our uh, focus uh, market is not film industry. Yeah, we will work with filmmakers, but we will make collaboration with advertising agencies. So we will invite brands, to make collaboration with filmmakers to give some utility NFTs. So this is our target model. So we will make branded content collaboration with brands. So we will focus on advertising agencies. So because of this, we will work with independent filmmakers and we will match them with uh, brand agencies. So because of that, the big studios are not our uh, first target. But, but you started with, all right, so now I'm a bit confused about what, what exactly is your product and what exactly is your go-to-market strategy. You started with making me believe that it was a, a film streaming platform. Yeah. Sort of like of Netflix and, and, and Amazon Prime and Apple TV Plus. But now you're saying that, well, that's a bit of an overlay for an underplay strategy. We want to sell NFTs, but we're we're a film a streaming studio. Like, are you an NFT, are you a blockchain-based company? that's building NFTs for the film industry or your film streaming platform that's going to provide NFTs on it? So we are focused on independent filmmakers. We are not focused on studio production. So we will invite independent filmmakers and we will build a branded content collaboration with them uh, to the advertising industry. So we are focusing independent filmmakers and we, are make, we, are we will make bridge between brands so this is our uh, uh, business model. This is our- uh, Okay, got it, got it, got it, got it. So I want to give a quick suggestion real quick. Perhaps you should revisit 
on what you believe your your company is because it's it's a bit over the shop. It's a lot of it's a bit over the shop. I would suggest that you position yourself like, hey, we are a conduit. We connect independent filmmakers with advertisers through the advent of the blockchain. So we yeah. sit in the middle. You all need access to the, to create things in the blockchain because you're independent. It's, it's your psychology, and you need a customer. And the advertisers are looking for individuals like you. We sit as a medium. But you started off by saying, "Can someone mute your mic?" Everyone, thank you. You started off. One that's completely different from what you're selling to us now, which provides a very a sense of confusion. So, if you are telling us that you are going to help independent filmmakers build in the blockchain, whether it's an NFT or crypto token or cryptocurrency, and yeah. connect them with advertisers that's willing to buy from them, that's a totally different type of company. Yeah, yeah. So it is a it's... wait, 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 wait. I, we have to move to the next one. We don't have a lot of time. We have twenty more than twenty three presenters. We we'll move to okay. Christopher Faraguna. You leave your information in the chat, and you continue the communication there. Okay, okay. Christopher Faraguna, you're next. Christopher. Can hey, you... hello everybody. How you doing? Uh, my name is Chris Faraguna from WinQuest Incorporated. WinQuest is a global augmented reality treasure hunting app like Pokemon Go. It works globally. It took us several years to build. We combined uh, augmented reality gaming with a data mining, and we're going to be a digital ad platform, and then an augmented reality digital platform. Uh, we have IP in for a couple of years on this, and this is a huge market. iMark says that uh, by 2027, the augmented reality gaming market is going to be a $38 billion industry. Um, it takes a while to build a platform to be able to do that. Our app is working. Again, globally, uh, it's, a, it's a native app, but we're working in Android right now. We're going to launch in Android. And uh, <clears throat> we have several revenue streams, such as in-app purchases, premium treasure hunts, pay for entry, premium tri trivia challenges, uh, guess the price challenges, monthly subscription packages, uh, collecting in-app revenue, merchant affiliate coupons, and then big party data to act as a conduit between merchants to users to connect, you know, the uh, products that merchants are trying to sell to users that like those products. So that's WinQuest. And uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Okay, thank you. Any questions from our panel? Anything to add? Any any comment? Can I just say, not so much of responding to the, the, the presenter, and, and, and thank you all so much for even taking the time to present to us. The founders aren't mentioning what, how much capital they're raising and at what value. And, that, and that's what this is all about. Like, I don't know how much capital yeah. they're I haven't heard one person say, this is what we're raising. This is, this is the valuation. This is the equity position. Here are the team members. Here's where we stand on, on our, our, I don't understand their funding pathway. So I would suggest as the founders move forward, really explain like the funding pathway and what you guys are raising. But that, that's all I wanted to add now. Okay. We're that's actually a great point. Uh, I agree with uh, this statement, uh, this Daniel Kislinski. Uh, I'm behind this scene so to make everyone have mm -hmm. a space in here. Uh, just uh, please make sure that you are trying to convince and sell yourself, uh, your startup to investors. So this funding thing and uh, Two minute pitch uh, uh, respecting time is super important. So go uh, respecting the rules and convince investors that's, that's your project is the one to invest. Okay, so uh, Christopher, can you say what is your ask? What is your current ask? How much you have raised up until now and so forth? Well, I've raised uh, 200,000 with friends and family. I put in 600,000 of my own into this app and uh, we're about to, we're hoping to launch uh, the first quarter of next year. And I'm looking to raise a uh, half a million dollars to get started uh, with convertible notes. And it will convert on a $5 million uh, infusion. Okay, thank you. Now I have questions. So you, you have, that sounds like $800,000. 200,000 friends and family. You said you placed in 600 grand. You guys can get the app built with $800,000? Yeah, I have, again, my, my app, uh, again, it, it takes a long time to get done what I have. If you have a chance, I'll show you what I have in the back end panel. No, no, no. Listen, listen. So, so, so the great thing about you and I talking, I'm a software engineer. 
yeah, myself yeah. and my CTO who's sitting beside me now, we built an app that has 3.5 million lines of code for $20,000. I'm, I'm confused as to how this app can get built with $800,000. Okay, well, uh, if you want to take a look at it uh, at another time, I could show you why it, it took that much to build it. Yeah, I'm not sure that if I look at it, it's going to shift my philosophy on the app and so what it actually takes to get an app done. I mean, even Fiverr, you can probably hire the company itself to build your app for $800,000. That is a lot of capital. If you can, in 20 seconds, explain to us exactly how you distributed that $800,000. Well, I, I, I have two engineers that work full time. I also paid about 480,000 to build the app. And I've had two engineers working on it to you know, fix the code that, uh, you know, the, the original- Oh, so wait a minute, there we are. So, okay, so there we are. So, so you paid someone, they did a horrible job, and then you had to pay someone else to fix it. Well, not a horrible job, but a bad job. In, in between. Okay, uh, it would be ideal to leave with that. It needed a lot of work. Okay. Well, yeah, it would be ideal to leave with that. I got you. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Let's move to the next uh, presenter, Jean-Claude. You're here. Hey, hey Luke. Uh, let, let's make sure the guys on the company side have a chance to respond and not just cut them off at the at the knees, give them a chance to speak because right now it's a little too aggressive, I think. Okay, yeah. So, uh, I mean, like we do have a lot of presenters and uh, the pre reason for that cutting is to to have, everybody can have a chance to say, uh, uh, to present. I mean, like, uh, and that's why we are uh, so in a hurry to, to, to go for it. Yeah, but yeah, we will give a chance to, 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 to answer everyone. Uh, yeah, so uh, if it's a little more than just a few minutes, we will give a chance, of course. Uh, but yeah, uh, we, will, we will make sure. Thanks for this comment. I, I got to tell you, I, if they were going in front of Elon Musk, they probably would have about 30 seconds. And I'm sure they would complain about it. So I, I would imagine they should treat us the same. Yeah, I'm not Elon Musk, nor am I Mark Cuban. So I want to give them respect so they can give the answers they want to give. Yeah, but you have value as well. So you may be you may be greater than Elon Musk and, and, and Mark Cuban in certain aspects. I'm sure. I mean, I play three. I play. I play three instruments. Mark Cuban and Elon Musk. They're, they're not. In, they're not musicians. So like, we all have value in certain capacities. Thank you, guys. Uh, let's continue. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yep. Let's go. Let's go with Jean Claude. Jean Claude. Yep. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So sorry, I'm not Elon Musk. I'm just <laughs> the CEO of Twitter. So don't kill me. Uh, over the past two years, we have invested a million bucks in uh, Fortuit to prepare the best emotional AI-powered digital platform for, market, uh, for making sorry, new friends in real life. So indeed, we reinvent one of the most rewarding and exclusive experiences, and we make it accessible to all generations and budget. I'm talking about the pleasure of meeting like-minded people in a private social club, building a sense of belonging, the exact opposite of loneliness we are fighting again, that kills 6 million people a year, almost as much as cancer. On one hand, we are a bit like we work because we dematerialize dedicated space with lounges that are assigned at the last minute to each user, thanks to AI matchmaking. On the other hand, a bit like Uber, in the sharing economy business model, since the 40 users of each group are co-organizers, and their private of their private gatherings. And it is very easy to book in a few seconds on their app. It's also about synchronicity, being at the right time, in the right place, and above all, with the right people. So on the customer perspective, we say for it will be the new normal when no plan is the best plan, and you are thinking, what am I gonna do tonight? Important, our concept is truly unique, and all our events are profitable as the platform will only activate launches based on a quorum as well as the staff. And as it's paid in advance, the cash flow from operation is always positive. The sum is about 300 million user for 200, 300 billion dollar in a trillion dollar uh, time. Additionally, during the day, we can monetize our venues on uh, staff, feeding the two trillion dollars B2B micro events market that is not yet consolidated, uh, and we've met Frenzer, one of our spin-off. So now speaking of investment, we are working on a series A of $10 million, leaving the door open for angels in a $1 million bridge. Trust me, we're on the verge of the next big thing that can, that can turn $100,000 investment into a billion dollar. 
This is not my first rodeo. We have solid data revenues from the AI and validated traction. Let's make a better world together. I'm here for your question. Thank you. Uh, Jean Claude, thank, thank you for the presentation. Something I wanted to emphasize, you know, I like the numbers that you talked about the market size, you know, the uh, customer segment, et cetera. So I would urge other um, participants to do similar things. Uh, it's always better to have some clear numbers. Now, uh, you mentioned that you already have traction. How much traction do you have? Like, what is your uh, current revenue for 2022 and what are the projections for the next year? Okay, so uh, the first revenue we have, because it's a complex, uh, in fact, it's a complex business with several entities. So the first revenue comes from, it's 100,000 euro only in France from the AI itself in the resource, um, human resources. Uh, it's a company we bought, work well together, uh, that has a um, very great algorithm developed over the last 15 years. Uh, our uh, revenue we had was a few thousand dollars. We made transfer testing uh, the method to build uh, the, um, uh, the mass crit the critical mass. Uh, so next year we will test in Montreal with a thousand person mm -hmm. uh, and this is without revenue. We will have about after that 10,000 uh, people test in uh, New York. Because if you understand the concept, we cannot really start to offer a real matchmaking as long as we don't have the critical mass. That's why we need about 10 million bucks. Okay, so you million... go ahead, please. No, 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 thanks. Go ahead. What would the two million dollars get us to, uh, Mr. John Claude? What What you say? The one? You said you're looking for two million dollars. What would the two million dollars? No, ten million. Ten million dollars. Okay, you're raising ten million dollars, sir. Yep. Okay. So the $1 million bridge you have, what would that achieve over the next six to 12? Okay, so the $1 million, uh, that's why we put the R&D company in uh, Canada. The $1 million leverage about six to $7 million from uh, Canadian government at different level. And uh, it's uh, R&D tax credits that can be fronted by uh, one of my friends who owns R&D Capital. Uh, so essentially this money, the 1 million will be to build the AI, uh, to make the test in Montreal with a thousand people. The overall $10 million, you didn't ask the question, is to make the test in New York at a big scale and uh, to ramp up the business. After that, we will go through a regulation CF as we work a lot with influencer and the regulation A plus. So it means uh, five plus $75 million uh, within the end of the year. Remind me of your traction and revenue and in users one more time, please. Yes, so for now, we have only 100,000 euros uh, in the resource, uh, human resources uh, business as a SIS. So that's a part of the business we will sell, uh, but it can be expanded over the next two years in uh, all the countries. Uh, we have customers like uh, uh, Carrefour, uh, uh, Cisco, so it's a uh, big fish, uh, but that's not the core of the business. That's the AI we took from this business that is interesting. Are you B2B to see then? So no, we are B2C uh, for Fortuit and uh, B2B for uh, uh, work well together, the company we purchase. And with mid transfer, we are B2B2C. I know it's complex, but it would be my pleasure to explain the uh, inner ecosystem as well as the exo ecosystem. I can tell you, for example, that within the end of 2024, we will have double or triple the uh, EBITDA of uh, a company like Tinder, for example, which is interesting for them. We are not in the dating but we, we, we will uh, facilitate uh, the meeting of the people because at the end of the day, uh, in, uh, for example, dating, uh, it's all wrong. The real money is not in matching the people together. Yeah, I will stop. It's, uh, it's uh, where people eat, where people drink, and you never see a bartender uh, to give a fees. Yeah, sorry. Yes, okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm here. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, you are, uh, you have an echo a bit about about yourself. Echo. Uh, when I got, uh, well, what about now? Better? Yes, a bit better. Okay, I'm saying, yeah, I, I think that it, you kind of touched on a point and I felt like that was kind of interesting because um, 
when you when you when you keep mentioning like AI matchmaking and people meeting each other, you keep like it, like it, it it gives me the image like oh, are, are you building another like dating app, right? Like you know, uh, so, I can so, imagine so the people the case. You, yeah. you should try to kind of differentiate yourself, like kind of make sure you're you're if that's not what you're building, you can you need to kind of try to like you know avoid that kind of images and not like getting yourself too associated from that or like you know to start d distinguishing yourself from the other dating apps like at the beginning rather than like you know uh kind, kind of keeping yourself like really comparing your like you know associated with in in, in in that way i would say uh i have another quick question i'm curious so like um for your ai what kind of what kind of data are you getting from the users to kind of make, make that match like work okay so uh, there, there are two questions one uh, I will not develop long, but not we will not be considered as um, uh, a dating. We have also a foundations for the seniors uh, with the royal family, uh, the Bourbon Palm. So it's it's definitely not like dating. But when you have like if you go in a bar and you and you see like a nice woman may or a nice man, maybe you will date. But it's not the purpose of uh, of the app. And it's definitely not like Bumble, you know, uh, swiping or there is no public profile available. You meet the people in uh, the venue. So about uh, the data, we will get the data that doesn't exist. And that was one of the reasons also to build that. At the beginning, we go with the work well together uh, algorithm that have developed Dr. Zor uh, Robert Zuli. Uh, it's an emotional profile of the person. So that's the first step. Then what they like in life and et cetera. So that give another uh, idea of who they are. But then what is interesting is when the people have uh, their uh, gathering together, during 24 hours, that's the only time they have the picture, the one picture of each people and the notes they have taken during the, the that time. They can say if they feel compatible, not compatible, like zero to 10 and give like some more details. So that way, uh, the based on um, deep learning, the machine will start to learn what are the friction, and we have patented uh, that uh, two patents on that, what are the friction and adhesions between the people? Because inter, um, interpersonal relationship is not a data available on Google, Facebook, et cetera, because they cannot measure that things. John Claude, I, I, I loved you, but now you lost me completely. Well, we have to talk offline, but uh, you were doing great until you jumped into this bar thing and you just kind of turned me off completely, but we'll, we'll get to it later on. <laughs> yeah, just uh, uh, please uh, leave, your, leave your contacts in the chat and uh, uh, you will connect and we will continue with uh, Greg Hodgin. Greg, oh, are you here? Please, uh, Moxon, uh, wait, wait a second. Please, okay. next Moxon, uh, he's one of the members. Oh, yes, he's one of the, our members. Yeah, go for it, Moxon. Doors, <laughs> I'm the co-founder of Amatech, and I just want to say thank you for giving me the opportunity to pitch. I would also like to start off by saying that in the U.S., there's currently 500 million tons of gypsum in its reserves, and it uses roughly 15 million tons of it per year. And if you're not familiar with what gypsum is, it is a very common natural mineral that is mainly used to create drywall and plaster. And these products are actually known as pretty weak products. And, uh, but what if I told you that in the next five years, the demand for gypsum will multiply tenfold? And what if I tell you that Amatech will be the reason behind it? You see, modern day technology does not allow gypsum to be a basic, reliable structural material the way concrete and lumber are. But that has finally changed. Amatech has created technologies, which we call high-density gypsum technologies, which finally allowed gypsum to be just that. And from this material, we could build houses significantly cheaper, faster, stronger, and much eco-friendlier than any other solution in the market. And in a country like the U.S., where there is over 5 million, there's over there's a shortage of homes that spans over 5 million. Um, and uh, there's a critical labor crisis, cr critical labor shortage and a material shortage. Our solution is needed and wanted more than ever. And um, we will actually be raising $3 million at a valuation of 20 million in April of 2022. So happy to answer any questions. You're creating, you're creating new material and you expect to 
produce it or license it or hybrid? Um, so we will actually be, we already produced it. Um, our goal is actually to build houses out of it. That's what we plan to do with the material. We don't plan on licensing it because it will not give us the opportunity to expand as quickly. So let me ask a question differently. Are you planning to build production production facilities to make this material on your own? Or will yes. You be okay. Uh, that's going to be pretty damn expensive. Uh, not, not as much as you would think. Uh, in our first stage, we actually want to um, build our very first pilot. Pro we actually want to, un want to undergo our pilot project. And we estimate that the cost for that will be $3 million. Um, part of that pilot project will include creating a mini production facility that will allow us to um, build our very first uh, tiny demo house. Um, the re one of the reasons why our production facility would actually be quite affordable is that our material would, has a very quick throughput rate. So the material goes from liquid to stone within 15 to 20 minutes. So we would actually be able to produce um, panels uh, for in uh, produce a lot of panels in a very short period of time, and we won't need as much space to do so. Uh, can I jump in here for a sec? Uh, so I've seen quite a few projects, you know, in in this in this uh, field, and one of the mistakes that a lot of startups are making are trying to create a complete value chain for the end customer. So in my opinion, if you guys are, you know, you're scientists, you you know how to create the material. Uh, you know, you should focus on that because if you never ran a construction company, if you never did housing, you know, this is a completely different business and a business model and it's a red ocean. There's so many players out there. But if you're saying, hey, we have this great, amazing material. First of all, I don't think you need to build your own facility to do it. You can have partnerships with, you know, players in the market to to kind of start running your, your first um, batches of materials and then align with the partnerships you know with the construction companies and uh, sell them the material you don't have to build the houses yourself to prove that your material is good because these are completely different business models and businesses and you will end up you know wasting a lot of resources trying to compete with everybody in, in those different fields so my suggestion here would be go with what you do the best if your guys are you know you chemists, you know, your engineers, you, you understand how to build and you create a new material. This is your core value proposition, you know, to the market. Just, you know, figure out a way how to use that, uh, you know, in your advantage and, and be just one of the creators. Like the cement factory does not build houses. Just, just keep that in mind. I mean, that market already exists and uh, you have to fit in with your new product into an existing market. Sure. Okay. So, 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 go ahead, sir. So, so a, a question. You, you said that you were raising two million dollars. What was the post valuation on that? Three million dollars at twenty million. Um, I know that might that may or may not sound very high at this very moment, considering that we are pre-revenue. Um, but we will be undergoing. Uh, we actually did get an investment um, that will require us to begin working in February, um, and. There's a lot of things I can't say right now. Um, I would be ha I will be happy to take that conversation offline, but um, we don't think see things. It's very high. So 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 you guys are roughly giving away fifteen percent of the company. Um, yes, roughly fifteen percent at this moment. Yeah, and, and is this a pre seed? This is the Series A. What what was stated? Oh no no no. This, we're we're pre. This this is pre seed. This is this is. This, you're doing a safe or a convertible note, or is this an equity? Is this the equity buy-in? It will be a safe. Okay, got it. And and what's the timeline? Well, how do you anticipate revenue from the next time you got you all raise capital? And the reason I'm asking the question because when I think about the valuation, the value that the investors are placing on your company at that moment, it's it has to be connected to the perception that you're going to be able to grow it. Because the idea is, for example, if I give you ten million dollars for ten percent. You have a hundred million dollar business. Ideally, you can sell it for a hundred million, but I only break even on my investment. If you can't take that value and get a, the next set of investors to agree to increase that value, where I can thereby make my money. So, what is your thinking on that? You don't have to answer to when you're raising capital next time, but what's your answer as far as like your your revenue between the time you raise this round and to your next round? So, once we do get that, once we do get that very first round off the table and we do have that $3 million, we actually plan on building our very first pilot project. And then once we show 
that we can build once we actually show that we can build that house, which we can show that we have built the production facility, we will actually raise the next round to actually expand um, into building more houses, um, build build a pretty much a bigger production facility to have a bigger throughput rate in terms of building houses. Um, but before that, we do suspect that we will actually build a few houses from the very own production facility that we will build um, in our first in our pilot project. So we will use that as evidence. Like here you go, these are our houses. We can build it. You can touch it. You can feel it, um, and you know it has these benefits. And then once we do feel the need to expand, um, which will require funding, of course, um, we will raise the following. Okay, I I'm suggesting us to move to the next presenter because we have 17 more people, and I bear, I think don't think that we will finish in two hours. Uh, so Greg Hojin is the next one. Greg, are you ready? You're muted, Greg. Yes, I'm ready. Absolutely. Go for it. Thanks. Uh, hi there. I'm Greg Hodgin, and I'm the founder and CEO of ZC Institute. Recently, the United States announced that they've achieved uh, ignition in a fusion reaction for the first time. And that's great, but it's going to take a long time to commercialize that and produce something that's usable in the global energy market. We are using a quark in physics to develop and create sustainable fusion within the next decade. We can create a microfusion reactor that's about the size of two fists put together that produce a terawatt of power. We do not need deuterium or tritium or any other kind of weird fuels. We can just use water instead. Climate change, the global water crisis, gone and gone. Oh, and I should probably mention that we can corner the global aviation market and colonize the solar system with this technology. Our ask is $2 million. Thank you very much. Thank you, very short and sweet. Yeah, Greg, how far along are you in the development of the prototype? You know, what do you have by now? Right now, we've got proof of concept. We've actually signed MOUs with two labs working with, to sign MOUs with three more. The goal is to create a number of research labs to help us finish up the tech, uh, the theory before we actually dive in. Um, building the fusion reactor will be probably within the next five to 10 years. We actually have to finish up doing the research on the technology first, which would be three to seven years, which is why this is pretty difficult as it is. The good news is that the federal government has a lot of funding for things like this. So any money that we get, we'll be able to double or triple by going to the federal government to ask for grants for the, to um, do the proof of concept. Um, so do you have any any program, any government program that you plan to participate in? Because, you know, the matching of the investment is important here. It's, you know, if you already have, uh, you know, like, I don't know, a soft commitment from a government entity saying, hey, if you find two million, we will give you another two, five million and that will help you to complete the research, then that would be a much stronger pitch to a private investor. Yes, so we actually have soft commitments from the NSF and from uh, the Department of Homeland Security, actually, because for some reason they think this is a national security issue. I can't imagine why. Um, um, each of these labs have actually already done a number of these grants as well, so they already have the expertise. Um, and we have two of them right now that are working on it. We've got one, um, one application that's in, we're waiting on it to come back right now. It should come back either this month, probably not this month, probably January at the very latest. And the next funding cycle starts next year. And we've already been told to apply. So that's kind of a soft push already for us. And each of the labs, we can only apply once, but we can do, um, a different federal agency for each of them. So we can kind of hit four or five or six different federal agencies to get the money that we need. One more question for me. Have you thought, or have you talked to any, you know, large companies, corporations out there? Who might have a like a VC arm to um, to invest in this project? Who might be interested in in this as a technology even before you put it out in the market? So we've already um, gone to big energy, so Chevron, BP, and those guys, and they basically said we would like to see the proof of concept before you do what's going on before you can before you kind of go on. We're thinking about approaching GE and Westinghouse because we don't want to build it ourselves because of supply chain and all that stuff. We kind of want to just do the licensing instead. We kind of want to, here's the licensing. We'll make the money off of that. GE and Westinghouse can kind of go through the, you know, the, the, the rest of it, right? Um, we do not, I have not talked to VC arms of those guys yet. I don't know how to contact them. Maybe I need to look them up, but that's a good point, And I will definitely do that. So I appreciate that. And one more thing. Are you connected to any university, any teams, you know, that would help you with, uh, with this? Oh, yeah. So um, they are, that's who we're partnering with. We're actually working with academic institutions and nonprofit guys who are doing this because each of them is kind of doing a piece of the theory. Like they're all doing one little piece. Our goal mm -hmm. is to kind of act like a consortium and have them all work together on it so we can coordinate whether you want to go and what you want to do. One of the MOUs we signed was with um, University of Alabama Huntsville. That's the guys in Rocket City who work with NASA and are doing their stuff. They, um, their head is a PhD in fusion engineering. So, yes, absolutely we do. 
Hey, Zamir, you asked all my questions. Hey, I don't. My, my bad. <laughs> no, that's great. That's okay, great. That's thank you. I I have to move the to the next presenter uh, because we have about fifteen people more. Uh, this will be from Warkai Healthcare. Abhiwash, are you here? Yeah, hi, thank you so much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon from wherever you are. So I am Abhilash and I'm the co-founder of LARKI Healthcare. So we are using artificial intelligence to read ECG reports. And today, the biggest problem which we face is that uh, heart or cardiovascular diseases go undiagnosed. So the cardiovascular disease market is about $54 billion worthwhile, which are prominently uh, run by GE, Philips, and similar large traditional companies. In all these cases, the patient has to go to the doctor or to the diagnostic center to get an ECG done. We have devised that we have made a device which can come to your home and it can transmit the ECG directly to the doctor's table or to his mobile or his laptop. This device basically is a novel device which captures the electrocardiogram of your heart and a phonocardiogram of your heart and transmits it over an internet to safely to a doctor's mobile or his or a server where the doctor can log in. He can then give his predictive uh, or he can give his uh, recommendation and start the treatment straight away. So this is a super uh, point of care device. And uh, we have an intellectual property and patent pending on this. Uh, we are in this uh, for asking for uh, half a million dollars uh, for a 10% equity in our company to launch this product outside India, where we are based, primarily into Europe and US. So we're looking for uh, a grant or a growth capital for expanding our market share. We have a traction of about $30,000 uh, in the last two quarters, and we are aiming to be about a $10 million company in the next three years. Uh, happy to answer your questions. Hey, any questions from the panel? Um, who would be paying for the device? Is it the patient? Is it the hospital? Is it the insurance company? Yeah, so the provider or the home healthcare provider would be paying for the device. So the model which we have is like you can pay as you go, as in you take the test and then you can pay us as you do the test. So it's pay per test or if you want to do an upfront investment, even that's possible. Currently, the model which is working for us is both in a hybrid manner. And what does the competitive landscape look like? There's no other devices right now that are doing this? Yes, yeah, so a life core has a device which uh, uh, went into a patent for with Apple, but that's more on the fun and fitness space. Uh, and then there are traditional manufacturers like G. Phillips Schiller, who are the traditional manufacturers. We are somewhere in between where we have a smart IoT device, but it's also a device which captures uh, within 30 seconds the heart ECG and transmits it over the net to a, a doctor sitting outside remotely. Any other questions? If not, we we'll wrap up. We we'll wrap up and move to Hello Baru. Tino, go. Tino, your turn. Hello. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me. Um, so my name is Tino Go. I'm the CEO and founder of Baru. After starting my own company out of high school, my background is in operations in Europe and the U.S. Uh, and since 2000 in corporate finance, I've been CFO for companies ranging for from $12 million that we grew to $85 million during the five years I was there. And my last role was overseeing a $1.2 billion business unit. I lead a team of senior industry and software and operations experts. We're reinventing manufacturing supply chains to avoid all of the long distance transportation uh, and shipping and handling of inventory that wastes $15 billion of a $35 billion TAM industry. So what we're solving for is in the future, most purchases will be custom made for every buyer. My company accomplishes this with a shared economy digital manufacturing platform. We're starting in cabinetry and furniture. So we're like Uber for underused manufacturing automation to avoid long distance shipping and inventory overhead. So we're in two verticals right now, uh, furniture and cabinetry. We're in 30 cities within 50 miles uh, of over 100 million people's Americans' homes and businesses. We're carbon negative. By reducing our global footprint to a hometown, we can wipe it out with, by planting a few trees per, per product. We also have a patent on the use of augmented and virtual reality to link a buyer's imagination with the machine instructions that drive manufacturing. 
Sales to date are 240,000. We have 400,000 in our Q1 sales pipeline. And I expect that 2023 revenues will exceed 5 million with about 35% operating cash flows. Our pre-seed round totaled 400,000. We're raising a million on uh, additional money on SAFE, capped at 8 million with a 20% discount. Our pre-seed milestones include development of our, our technology for distributed manufacturing, We've expanded to 30 cities nationwide and will soon cover the top 60 metro areas. We're uh, integrating uh, dealers and other B2B customers as well as having our, our e-commerce site. The Department of Defense is interested in, and other enterprise customers are interested in this. So what you see is what you get AR device that allows any non-technical user to modify art for on-demand digital manufacturing. I'm also recruiting uh, for an operations professional that I'll put in the in the chat. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Um, if you don't mind, I'll go first. So Tino, yeah, thanks for the presentation. I, I enjoyed the numbers and uh, that you mentioned the team in the beginning and your experience is all good. Uh, I'm actually interested in, in, in your project, so I would like to talk offline. Now, the question is, I, I got a little confused. So I'm all for this, you know, um, on-demand manufacturing locally, because especially after the COVID, you know, the supply chain got broken and uh, it, it's, a, it's a global trend, you know, producing locally. Uh, so you are there, but I got really lost when you started talking about these neuro devices, you know, with imagination and everything. So this is like a completely yeah. different things besides what you're doing right now. So- uh, No, uh, they're connected. Let me explain. Okay, go ahead. So during the process, one of the challenges uh, throughout uh, has been how do we translate what's in someone's imagination into machine instructions for on-demand manufacturing? So during that process, uh, one of my co-founders said, we can use augmented reality for that. And so by using your device and changing the picture in the device and having that dynamically change the machine instructions, that's effectively a link between imagination and manufacturing. Let me ask you this quick question then. Do you believe that uh, your model is going to be doing a lot of small custom individual jobs locally for whoever, for like the B2C, or there is a B2B part to it when you're going to be just helping these smaller furniture companies, you know, produce here locally? What is the, what is the model? The, the model is a, uh, is a shortened supply chain to eliminate uh, all of the, the, you know, and, and so, we, we are selling on our e-commerce site to individuals, individual desks, attorneys are buying seven foot long sit stand desks. But we're also, uh, the, we're also, we also submitted a quote and which I very feel very confident about of 326,000 for 177 rooms to be converted into senior living apartments. And um, so it goes both ways because we're di completely digital and we're just connecting suppliers with customers efficiently. We can we can scale up. You know, our minimum quantity is one. Maximum quantity to date is 1,500 cabinets within a two and a half month term period, time period. Yeah. Let's let's connect and talk more. Thank you. So so, okay. so Tino, no, hi, hi Tino. Uh, yeah, really quick. Hi Tino, my my fellow Detroiter. <laughs> so. What's, what's, what's the end goal for you? What, what is the exit strategy? I'm really interested in that. In, in addition, what's your primary vertical? Because I know that like you guys really emphasize cabinets. What's your primary vertical and what's the end goal for the entire company? Because I, I am interested okay. in this company. I, I talked to my wife, I'll talk to my wife about it. We're very interested. Yeah, so the, the, the business is to drive under machine demand for underused machines. That's the business, it's like Uber. We're starting with wood because there are a bunch of these machines and that the data set around wood is sufficiently normalized that we can create a digital process. The end goal is to integrate any kind of latent uh, customer demand and, tar and associate it with someone else's digital fabrication needs. So it's a reinvention of from first principles industries. So the Obviously, the end goal is a liquidity event. For the furniture division, that could be Pinterest because they know the frustrated shoppers and we can produce what those frustrated shoppers want. And, uh, but
but overall, I'm envisioning that once other people see this rapidly scaling company, they will replicate it in their own industries to deglobalize manufacturing as a whole. But we have, we're building our moats around the, around the set verticals and sectors that we wanna play in. And then we have this patented technology around the use of AR and VR. It's what you see is what you get manufacturing. That will be a separate subsidiary and a SaaS platform. Okay, thank and you. And we're building an that we internal tool that will be usable as a SaaS within our within the cabinet making industry also. Thank you, Tino. Please leave your information in the chat. And we'll move from with uh, Williams from Tr Truck. Williams, are you here? Yes, I am. Thank you very much. My name is Williams Patayo. I am the CEO and co-founder of Truck. I spent the last decade of my life across engineering, sales with Microsoft, brand and marketing, communications, logistics, and entrepreneurship in logistics. Right now, we are building Africa's first operating system for third-party logistics. Third-party logistics is hard anywhere in the world, but it's incredibly harder in Africa. Businesses struggle to, with access to third-party logistics assets, like vehicles, the struggle with pricing, the struggle with real-time oversight, the struggle with a long list of manual and inefficient processes. First thing we needed to do as a business was bridge, was um, figure out and solve that access gap and solve the experience gap. We've made significant progress along the line of that, over to about close to 20K trips and close to $1 million in GMV as of today. And right now, the market and data is pointing us towards something very exciting, an operating system for third-party logistics, both on the demand side and for the supply side. We rolled out the beta version of the operating system for the demand side um, in Q4 this year, and it's been doing pretty well. Now, businesses are able to enjoy route optimization, load optimization, um, delivery management and reconciliation, cash on delivery collection and remittance, everything they could possibly need with third-party logistics on our infrastructure. Exciting times ahead of us. We're currently present in three states in Nigeria as we try to expand into eight states, eight countries in Africa by 2025. We're currently raising $1 million at $10 million valuation. We're a textiles company. We've brought in just about $330,000 up until this point. And we can't wait to show you and walk you through what the future holds for us. Please reach out to me. Um, Via my email, I dropped it in the comment section. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. That was amazing. Any comments? Yes. So great presentation. <clears throat> I can feel like the passion in there. <laughs> Where are you guys headquartered in in, in over in Africa? Uh, we are a U.S. company in Delaware, but we are operational yeah. in Nigeria as of today. Got it. And what's the strategy for you, your your product, or your your go to market across the continent? I'm being biased because my wife is from Sudan, so preferably you say Sudan is in your pipeline. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Two things. One, uh, we have as customers now some of the biggest B2B e-commerce companies on the continent as of today, from market force to trader, market force to trader for to only bees and all. So um, primarily we'll be expanding based on the market presence of our current customers. The efficiency we've been able to establish for them in Nigeria, they're excited to replicate in other markets while we'll be um, onboarding newer customers across every single country we'll be expanding into. But what we're trying to do is gain market presence across the, um, um, across the distribution of Africa, from West Africa to East Africa, to the MENA region, to South Africa, uh, as we journey on. We'll, we'll have market presence across the continent, across all of the distribution of Africa by the end of 2025. Then we would gain ground and expand within those locations over the coming years. Let's connect uh, on on. But yes, on we might just we might just eat Sudan before 2025 too. <laughs> yeah, let's connect on LinkedIn. I, I would love to talk to you offline. Awesome, thank you very much. Okay, leave your information in the chat, and we'll we'll move with Eugene. Eugene from Level Up. Eugene, you're muted. Bridge one second. Change my earphones. Can you hear me now? Yeah. The floor is yours, Eugene. Thank you so much. 
Uh, I'm Eugene, co-founder and CEO of Level Up Basket. Uh, it's a basketball training platform uh, powered by gamification and social features. We uh, have almost 50,000 players on the platform, about 2,000 coaches. Uh, right now, we're generating something like 2.5K MRR. Uh, we're raising uh, $1 million. So far, we raised 225K, and we're launching soon with under crowdfunding platform. And so our target for the next year to, is to reach 50K MRR and raise big round for, for, for the global scale. So right now, uh, uh, we're disrupting the $200 billion traditional basketball training market with our app. We have 300 uh, mm -hmm. plus uh, high quality educational videos on the platform. And we want to make it the biggest like Strava for basketball in the world community of basketball players. That's it. Okay, thanks. Any questions from the panel, from our sharks? Uh, I would How like just to, yeah, I would like just to comment because I, I know Eugenie's uh, project. You know, I see the you guys are growing. Good job. Uh, you know, for for us to invest, it would still require a little higher uh, revenues. But you know, come back uh, when when you guys uh, reach uh, those levels. You know, good luck to you. Okay, thanks so much. What, how is the WeFunder campaign going and where are you guys located headquartered? Yeah, I'm based in New York City. We are, head, uh, we are uh, incorporated in Delaware. Uh, so WeFunder, we had quite a long, like a lot of time, uh, uh, took some legal mm -hmm. paperwork that we're launching next week on Thursday. And we expect like our current investor uh, committed 50K for this WeFunder launch because we need a lead investor on the platform to launch. And we plan to at least double, triple this amount of money uh, on the platform and gain more uh, uh, users uh, also uh, from, from the platform because we have like a couple of users already uh, invested like 2,500, uh, uh, like uh, $250 uh, on the platform just because they love the app. So we have 70% of users organic in the app, and we believe that this uh, open approach to fundraising will help us to gain more users and more money. So when I come in, can you walk me through the user journey? I, I come inside of your app, I want to get a better three-point shot. Do I get connected with Lethal Shooter from Instagram immediately? Um, uh, like right now, you can find a lot of high quality videos uh, created with professional coaches on the platform. You can do it by yourself. Uh, but uh, pretty soon we launch the marketplace uh, for coaches. So right now the coach search is pretty simple. Uh, it's not not with filters, but soon you will be able to find a coach for online coaching. So you don't need to meet in person with a coach. You connect with him uh, in the chat, integrated chat in the app. You can uh, drop him your videos, and basically this is uh, this coaching session is like assistant, uh, your basketball assistant, the person who communicates with you and create and assign reels for you inside our app. So our app is kind of dashboard for you, what you should do, what day, and uh, uh, what exercises. So one more question. So it sounds to me, I'll start with, with a statement. It sounds to me like, like it's a bit of a cold syrup for, for getting basketball training. Is there an opportunity in the future where you open a vertical, you're partnering with gyms, you reach out to the, the distribution of Instagram because there's so many basketball players on there. And they have just a, a wide range. In fact, as you would imagine, a lot of them got NBA jobs just from having Instagram pages. Is, it, is there an opportunity there where you can partner with local gyms, you can tap into the distribution of the, the basketball players on, on Instagram who have those NBA relationships where your app can become the de facto place where I'm looking to book lethal mm -hmm. shooter or I'm looking to build, 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 book dribble too much to learn, get better handles. I can one, book them directly or I can book a camp to be a part of to go to that camp on a, a monthly basis whereby you get a transaction fee. Do you see that opportunity in the future? Yeah, absolutely. That's basically where we're now uh, developing the creator's economy uh, approach in the app to engage coaches in uh, producing their own content inside our platform because it's uh, social and gamified. So we want coaches to be engaged in the content creation inside the app. And basically the, the high level plan is to reserve like 10, 20% of all revenue for this kind of uh, creators fund and distribute those money uh, between uh, coaches, basically creators inside the app who will help us to get to gain more content inside the app. So creators economy is the key focus. Right now I'm negotiating with some US investors 
really very much interested in the, this part of creators economy of the platform. So the, yes, the answer so, is yes. We so, focus on that. So Willie really quick, I'm highly interested in this idea. My wife and I, we okay. invest at the earliest stage. We invest at the napkin stage. You have an idea on the napkin because we're operators. Mm -hmm. So our idea is we can place a small check inside of a company. We actually, we're programmers, we're graphic designers. So we, we, we marry our skills with people that we believe in and ideas that we believe in. I, I don't mm -hmm. have enough time to communicate my interest, but I'm highly interested in this idea. So I would recommend to oh. contact me immediately, immediately. Okay. Yeah. The, I'll do it yeah. for sure. You Thank you so much. Communicate via in, chat. In, in 10 and, seconds or less, how's the value of this company going to go for an investor? What's the value for this investment to me? In 10 seconds or less. Yeah, it's pretty simple. So uh, the exit strategy is M&A. Uh, we have several uh, similar deals on the market. So basically we're targeted to NBA launched its NBA equity recently. And there are several big players like Nike, Adidas would be ready to, to purchase the company because of the audience. We will gain uh, like the, like struggle for basketball, basically. And any apparels, because the most value of money in, in, in the sports and apparels. So it's pretty simple. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's move to the next one. And this will be Max Antonenko. Max, are you here? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hello? Raise the hand. <laughs> yeah. Hello from Chicago. I am Max Antonenko, founder of Ant Robotics. I am third time technical founder. Our self-driving robots are the only robots can move pallets and skids through the narrow passages of small and medium manufacturing floors suffering from workforce shortage. This year, Antrobotics named among the top five interlogistic startups impacting manufacturing by Startups Insights. We acquired Verizon, as a first customer, and a couple of days ago, we signed a contract with the jet engine part supplier of Rolls-Royce and Lockheed Martin. We are starting our pre-seed round after the Christmas, targeted to $1.5 million. If you fit your venture scope, happy to chat, and I'll put all, all, all my contacts into the, Zoom, into the Zoom right now. I'm, that's it. Max, tell us about your revenue model. Tell us about your forecast for the next couple of years, and most importantly, any IP, please. Yeah, uh, our revenue model. So we sell in robots for 35K with uh, almost 65% uh, margin. And also we have recurring uh, revenue part, which is $6,000 for every robot connected to our robot orchestration system. Our plan for next year is to reach a uh, couple of million dollars in revenue. So because uh, we required to sell only 25 robots for each $1 million in revenue. And that means for us like three, five small companies or one big company. And about the IP. So uh, we didn't yet uh, uh, get any patent, but we have an opportunity to patent our mechanical parts and algorithms. How many machines do you have out there right now? Sorry? How many robots do you have out in the market? Uh, we have zero robots on the market because we just signed a uh, first contract with first real customer. Tell me about market validation, if you can, please. Any POCs, any MVPs? Uh, no, we have no POCs and MVPs. Uh, so we have MVPs, so we talked to dozens of customers here in Midwest, and because of that, so we pivoted our company and targeted to their uh, palette moving. So because uh, our small and medium manufacturers, they are moving their materials and parts um, based on the pallets. Um, yeah. How do we know the thing works? Uh, so because we talked to them, so and because we signed our first contract. Thank you. Okay. Hey, Max, so, so, <laughs> uh, so, so I, I'm curious. Uh, so I, I feel like we've been, it's been a year since we spoke last time, but like, I, yeah. what, what's been the, what's been, uh, yeah. So, so what's, what's, what's the, um, 
what's been the focus for the use cases you've been looking at? So I remember before it was the material handling, right? It's also kind of the key focus for you guys here right now? Yeah, the same, the same focus. Material handling and manufacturing floors primarily small and medium. Okay. So, so, so quick question. Uh, okay. Yeah. Please. Yeah. <clears throat> so so you, you said you haven't started the, the patent process, correct? We didn't yet start it. Okay. Can you can you talk a little bit about it, we're not divulging too much. What do you think, like, what's your actual technology? When, when you start to patent process, what do you think, what are the methodologies that you think are strong that's going to favor your actual technology? I would love to hear a little bit more about that. Uh, yeah, so it's uh, the, so a couple of algorithms. Uh, first algorithm is moving with a trailer, so because other robots, they are moving alone. Uh, and another algorithm is docking to a pallet. So, and the third one is mechanical part, it's special coupling equipment with uh, which our robots manage manual pilot jacks, standard equipment available everywhere. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think we should move to our next one. Uh, Taka Kamezawa. Taka, are you here? Oh, yes, I am. Go for it, Taka, your turn. Oh, so it, it's I'm on the, on the screen. Yes, yes, okay. you're on the screen. Okay, great, great. Thank you for everybody. I'm Taka Kamezawa, co-founder of Trilogy. We are pioneering metabolite use for agriculture. I want to ask everybody a question. If there's a relationship lasted 450 million years, would you like to invest that company? So Trilogy is such a company. So when the, when the plants first appear on the dry land, 450 million years ago, they need the help of soil microbes, these are fungi and bacteria. They, they have symbiotic relationship, a metabolite platform technology enhances it through signaling. So as you know, fertilizer prices went up like 300%. We have a proof that we can cut down the synthetic fertilizer usage up to 75%, still positive yield. We have an exceptional season with a grower. One of the latest results for corn with only one application of our soil booster, true soil, we increased the yield for corn by 15.9%. It's only eight ounces. One of our competitor, you know, one unicorn company, their yield increase is only 5%. So we are three times better. So other thing that we do is we extend the shelf life. Also, we have a study where Organic soybeans, farmer experience, significant drought, and two application, uh, product uh, increases yield over 60%. So uh, we have all, close to $2 million in revenue. We have a great team. Uh, one of our co-founder is Andrea Thesis. She's the chief commercial officer. She's a veteran of microalgae industry. Her former company was sold at $1.1 billion to Martech. We are at the stage where a lot of large chemical companies are knocking a door for potential investment and or joint product development. So we are closing the seed round today and prepare for the, the series A next year, but we might do a bridge round uh, in January. That's where we are. So I'm happy to answer your question. I think we are the next big thing for the global agriculture. Thank you. Does our panel have any questions? Uh, Tata, did, did you say? Oh, please yeah. go ahead. Go ahead. I think okay, Duran, just go for it. Yeah. Did, did you did you mention uh, something about any intellectual property? Oh yes, we we are uh, production facilities already patented. And we filed the two mode of action, how our product works in the soil. Okay, so my, my question there is, because I, I love the IP conversation, which are patent, how many claims did, did you receive inside of the patent? Just to understand the efficacy of the patent itself, how many were approved? So, so two, and, and we, as we uh, continue to develop more technology, we will file more patents. So that, that's our strategy. Okay, thank you. Uh, Taka, I know your company, but for the purpose of the audience, can you dumb it down what you do without using any technical terms? 
Okay, so, so macroalgae is a seaweed and kelp. Microalgae is the initial living organism. We have uh, two microalgae strains, they complement each other. We, we cultivate it, but we filter out the biomass completely. And the, when the microalgae grow, they express metabolites. These metabolites are needed for microalgae to grow. Our major discovery is these metabolites, when we apply to the soil, it increases the prolification of the soil microbe up to 1,000%. So we are igniting this incredible relationship the plants and micro ha microbe has for 450 million years. So you, this is the dumbed down version. I would hate to see what the complicated version sounds like. So your microalgae does what? It helps the plant absorb better fertilizer? Or so, 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 uh, so for example, uh, uh, the mycorrhizae fungi actually penetrate inside the plant root and became a part of the root structure. We increased the mycorrhizae you know, number over 100%. So, so that's how we do. We, there is an existing biology between plants and the soil fungi. We, we increase these uh, relationships, especially increasing the number of these micro, soil microbes from 100% up to 1,000%. Okay, so we need the microbes to help the plants digest the food better, et cetera? Yes, so, so, yeah, so for example, yeah. tree lophory, the leaves has lots of nutrients. We increase the trichoderma, one of the fungi, over 1,000%. Trichoderma breaks down the organic matters. Thank you, sir. Thank you, too. It appears that Duran and Eugene might make a deal finally. So. I think that, uh, that that will be a good news for uh, people that will participate. And we'll move with Steve Bong. Steven, are you here? Hi, uh, my name is Steven Bong, and I'm the CEO and founder of auditfile.com. We're the world's first cloud-based solution for CPAs who perform audits. Growing up, my dad was a CPA, so I got to see the uh, the software he got to use. So. When my brother and I were about to finish college, uh, we had some jobs lined up, but we thought, hey, let's try to start a company. How hard could it possibly be? Uh, it turns out it was really hard. <laughs> so we have three direct competitors. It's Thomson Reuters, CCH, and this Canadian company called Caseware. Um, and all three of them share a problem. They're all uh, legacy on-prem solutions. So we're the first cloud-based solution. Um, I'm gonna <laughs> rush this here, but uh, basically we pioneered the field of quantitative accounting when I was in college, in grad school, uh, I worked as a quant. We took concepts from physics and engineering and applied them to finance. The black Scholes, you know, to, to model uh, to stock options is actually just the heat equation that you learned about in uh, differential equations. Um, so we have five patent applications. One was approved, uh, patent 10,891,294. Uh, you can go look it up. And so, uh, it's a big market auditing software. It's about $2 billion. It's not $20 billion, not $200 million. That's according to our competitors' regulatory filings. And uh, let's see here. Um, we're doing about $2 million a year in sales right now. Our largest customer is the Emirate of Dubai. We have uh, over 400 customers. The sun never sets on our customers, uh, which is fun for all the phone calls. <laughs> Uh, our business model is pretty simple. It's software as a service. We charge about $200 per user per month for the uh, privilege of using our software. And uh, right now it's just me and my brother. Uh, I went to UC Berkeley. My brother went to UCLA. He worked as an auditor at Deloitte. So he knows just, in the, just as enough auditing to be dangerous. Mm -hmm. And uh, we raised $2.8 million so far. And we're raising uh, another five on a 20 pre priced round. Uh, we did 500 startups, uh, Tim Draper's an investor and, uh, yeah, we're, uh, looking for, for investors. Any questions? Uh, Steven, hi. Yeah. Uh, pretty impressive. If it's just you and your brother, you know, he's making the $2 million in revenue, but how many people do you have in your team? Just, just me and my brother. Just you and your brother. Wow. Yeah. So uh, we are interested in, in looking deeper into you guys because you you fit the, the profile of, a, of an ideal um, starter for us, uh, you know, with what you do with the business model, if, with the current traction. Uh, what I wanted to, to understand, uh, who are your ideal customers? You mentioned that there's quite a few of them, but, you know, if you can tell me 
uh, who's your largest group that you? Um, oh, it's provider? it's mainly uh, CPA firms. So uh, small to medium sized CPA firms is where. So this we're... is a the, the software supporting their their work as CPAs. Yeah. So a CPA who uses audit file to do their audits, they'll be using audit file all day, every day to do their job. So it, um, I can get into like the technical accounting things, but it pulls the trial. No, no, no. You, you don't have to, yeah. but do you basically save time for them or you, you, you know, provide a lot more data insights? What is the, the value that you give them? We enable auditors to get their audits uh, done faster and less with less risk. So um, that's our basic value proposition. We're more expensive than our competitors, but it's because we provide a better product. All right, let's let's connect. I'll be interested to look into the. Sure. Yes, I mean, how is it different from zero? I, 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 have a, I have a big question for you. You're sure. making two million dollars a year, but you're raising money. Yeah, that seems disconnected. Two people, two million dollars a year, but you're still raising money. Where's the money going, my friend? Well, right now it's going to me, um, but what we want to do is build an enterprise sales team with like real, you know, a real enterprise sales team. Because right now me and my brother are trying to fly around the world, servicing our large customers. It's, it's hard. And to get good people, it takes real money. So that's why we're raising money. So you're building a team basically. Yeah, we have the product I, I think is in a pretty good spot. I'll be frank with you. What I don't have is enterprise sales experience. I don't know what I don't know about enterprise sales, right? I'm a Unix neckbeard computer programmer, right? Uh, I don't even pretend. Uh, so what we need help with is going from 2 million a year in sales to 10 million a year in sales. That's our, you know, our next milestone. So Th thank you. Thank you for that. And very quickly, uh, this is a SaaS pro uh, product, right? Offer as a service. Yes. Can, can you give us a quick rundown on the KPIs? What's your churn? What's your average uh, value per account? What's your um, your CAC uh, and so forth? Uh, yeah, can we do that? Or I can, I can do it right now. Um, we, we, let can me... do it. we can do it offline if you want. Yeah, yeah, right. I'll, I'll just... yeah um, our... everyone is, is interested. Please, uh, if you can do it right now, please yeah. do it right now. Yeah. Oh, um, uh, annual contract value is about $5,000 a year. Uh, per per firm, so and that happens because we have a long a long we you know we have big customers, but a lot of our customers are just sole practitioners, two three man shops, um, and let's see, our uh, we're growing about eighty percent year over year, so it's not great for you know Sand Hill Road, but that's where we are. Um, lifetime value of a customer we estimate to be about fifteen thousand dollars, and that's. Uh, you know, there's two different ways of calculating churn. We like to use the uh, the, the the revenue churn method because that's what's real to us. You know, um, so our our churn is about uh, one, about eight percent per month is our our revenue churn. Um, and uh, let's see, um, average user uses audit file about 23 hours per week, and our um, free trial to paid conversion ratio is 79%. Thank you for the information. Um, yeah. Appreciate it. Zammer, if you talk to him, so, like so, him yeah, we would like to come in the deal if you like it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah oh, sure. Uh, definitely, definitely we'll look deeper. So I would encourage uh, to contact me uh, today <laughs> and then okay. we'll, you know, and, uh, and then I'll talk to you too. You know. Sure, sure, sure. Congrats. So that's the so, second so quick. Quick. potential soft commitment we have i'm really excited to quick. see that yeah quick 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 question and by the way yeah that, that that's that's great too Daniel. i downloaded that, that basketball app it's a really good app it's really clean so i'm super excited about that so quick question you your, your company's been around since 2011 huh yeah and in, in you raised about six million dollars and, and the last raise was in 2014 about the no, three million dollars that, that's not accurate we raised uh two okay. point $8 million. And that's not even all currently outstanding because with our revenue, we've bought out a lot of investors. Um, okay. So, so I, I've seen this on the crunch base. So perhaps someone needs to contact them so that that can be updated. Okay. So <clears throat> what, what, what's your goal as far as the growth on the business? Like is your, is your exit strategy to sell to a, a bigger company or what's your pathway as far as your growth is concerned? And that's connected to the life. You know, the life honestly, I don't even really 
think about that because I've been doing this for a decade. My life's vocation now is making auditing software. So, you know, the goal is immediate goal is to get to 5 million in sales, right? How are we going to get there? How are we going to get to 10 million in sales, 100 million in sales? Um, I, I, I mean, if we take Sand Hill Road or institutional money, you know, they got to harvest their, you know, in seven to 10 years. I, I don't, I just want to, you know, make this the number one auditing software in the world. That that's that's how I'm thinking right now. So, I mean, yeah, I guess maybe some kind of M and A or something in seven to ten years, maybe go public. I don't know. We're a two person company, so that's, you know, I, I'm not going to pretend like you know what's going on. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I just want I want to buy a Pilatus TC12. That's what I want. So whatever gets me there is uh, is what I want. All right, guys. Uh, I guess I guess we gotta move on to the next speaker. Appreciate that. I'm really excited to see that this is the second uh, soft commitment, and there are so many messages and uh, contacts exchanged in the chat. So, all investors, uh, if if you guys want uh, us to connect with any of the startup you've seen, just reach us out. We will do a personal introduction to the startups you want, uh, and so there will be more chances for uh, founders to uh, get funded. So, all right. Uh, the next speaker is David Siegel. Uh, David, are you ready? Yeah, here I am. Thanks, everyone. Hi, Welcome Luke. Two minutes. I'm David Siegel. I'm the founder of the Infinite Game of Life. I've started a dozen startups. I've had a few exits, and I was a candidate to be the dean of Stanford Business School. Right now, coaching is an exponentially growing business, exceeding $14 billion a year, but it's also broken. After a few months, many clients reach a point of diminishing returns for their coaching dollar, and yet coaches who don't enjoy marketing they want clients who pay forever. So my new platform's disruptive business model solves both problems. For clients, we give them a platform where they pay one fee every month and they get 10 hours a month to spend on any business or personal expert in our, on our platform, on a Zoom call or on, on the phone in just hours. We'll have a world-class specialist in many areas of business and personal coaching. Now, for coaches, our goal is to provide steady income and relief from the need to market constantly. Coaches put half their hours into our scheduling system and they take any calls they get scheduled. In return, we'll pay them a regular ten dollars to $20,000 per month, depending on demand. We're onboarding coaches easily right now, so there's no chicken and egg problem. Our clients are business owners with two to $100 million in revenues. Our marketing strategy is to go after niches, hedge funds, SaaS, software, professional services, retail, et cetera. We're gonna work with several agencies I've already interviewed and find, find clients looking for coaches, get them into our funnels and convert them. If you're interested, if you're here and interested in being a coach, please contact me. I've gotten some great coaches from, this, uh, from these kinds of forums. This is a pre-revenue company seeking $300,000 in a safe note with a cap at $3 million. We do not expect a later round. I don't expect much, if any, dilution. So you can wait and see how we do, but I don't expect to come back raising money again because the business throws off cash from day one. Uh, you can see our growing list of coaches at, the, at infinitegameoflife.com. I'm happy to take any questions. Well, raising the bar. So, uh, yeah, it's like making the urgency for the investors. Thank you for that. All right, guys, uh, who wants to ask the questions? <laughs> Hi, David. How, how do you get around uh, preventing a leaking funnel, right? Like coaches get their, cus uh, get, get their clients and over time they, they, they have their own relationship. They get, get offline and cut off the middleman. How do you prevent that kind of uh, uh, things from happening? Yeah, I, I don't really worry about that because it's a good question. But but in general, coaches need more clients all the time, and they hate marketing. So they might they'll have a client for a while. And they can take them off the platform. That's fine. They're going to need more clients. And every I'm having no problem getting coaches. Coaches are very excited about this because they don't want to do marketing. They just want to get booked and help customers. So I don't, I think I'm going to be all right on that. But we'll see how that goes. But it's a good question. Can you elaborate a little on your current traction? Like how many coaches do you have on the platform? How many customers? Yeah. What is the revenue yeah. going in between? This is pre-revenue. I'm, I'm building the platform. I'm raising money for marketing. It's mostly marketing expense and a customer service person. Uh, only need, I really only need like $100,000, but I'm raising 300. 
uh, several of the coaches I've signed up have already invested. Um, so I plan to launch in about uh, February, March. And I'll oh, launch see. it even if I don't. Even if I Got don't it. get the money, on, I'm going to bootstrap it. So, so I've seen several platforms like this, you know, from like five, six years back. Uh, and I, I was even at one of those platforms as a coach myself. Right. Uh, and unfortunately, the traffic that I was receiving, you know, was very low, like maybe right. uh, one, one or two calls every couple right. of weeks or so. So that, there is a problem of chicken and egg. So have yeah. you seen other platforms like this that succeeded, that became large, that became big? Uh, and what would yeah. you do different from those who did not? Yeah, um, I'm not in that business. It's not really coaching. That's expert networks. There are tons of them. I'm on several. They never, never call you back. They're mostly harvesting your data and looking big that way. Uh, those are really going after enterprise clients. I'm going after mid-market business owners. It's not, it's not executive coaching at all. Uh, it's mid-market business owners. That market is on fire. There are tons of individual solo coaches uh, getting those clients. And I'm doing, I'm really the first to aggregate a number of different coaches into one platform. So you, as a business owner, you can choose who you wanna talk with and work with every month. You can also give your hours to anybody on your team as much as you like. So there, there's a viral component and there are personal oh, coaches. For got it, got it, for the, for the sake of time, sorry to interrupt you. Now, sure. j just for everybody, a little piece of, uh, of comment here. If this is not built yet, there might be two reasons. Either this is very, very disruptive what you're doing or a lot of people tried and never succeeded. So in the situation sure. with, with the marketplace, with coaches and you know, with the business model that you're trying to build, I would really encourage you to investigate more into why many previously failed and not repeat their mistakes. Because it's been around, this idea has been around for a while. And I've seen yeah. quite a few of them pop up and then you know uh, disappear so there might there, there's got to be some kind of a systematic problem why this matching doesn't work in a in a, a scalable way fair enough uh the big the most people are venture backed and they go after enterprise and i'm not interested in that market so i think it's an untapped market but it's a good comment more questions okay so uh, uh, before we continue to the next uh, startup, uh, dear investors, I need your approval for, uh, for continuing because we are past two hours and uh, the deal was two hours. And uh, are you up or we continue because we have 11, uh, 12, 12 companies? All right. Good. That's good. How much time do you need then? Uh, I think it will take at least 30 minutes, maybe a little more, but around that, it feels, it feels like that. Depends on the people, how long they answer. I'm, I'm good for 15 minutes if you need me. All right, no problem. And we'll continue after you. So that, thank you. Thank you so much for staying. All right. Uh, the next one is Marcus Levels. Uh, Marcus, you ready? Please unmute. Hey, I have yes, one question. Yes, sorry. sorry, this is Ben uh, with Gesture. I actually have a, an investor meeting in a few minutes. Can I go after this one, if that's okay? Yes, please. Yeah, I will thank be. You. Thank you, Ben. Thanks, everyone, for having me. Um, I'm from Holloway. I'm one from co for co-founders um, from a university spin-off, and we commercialize a set of breakthrough inventions for holographic microscopy. So 3D microscopy to see cells and microorganisms better and faster and more automated than with any other technology ever available globally. Why is this relevant? Because many industries, including the food industry, the pharma industry, um, energy and environmental monitoring need to understand microorganisms, for example, to produce vaccines and other medication, to produce alternative proteins, clean meat, or simply beer, and to produce things like biofuels. Currently, to monitor those processes, they need to do a lot of manual uh, microscopy. They get pretty bad data with long time delays at huge costs. This is very unsatisfactory it leads to huge costs for the producers and bad products. We solve all this by providing automated data with a high throughput and great quality. Our team includes the, the two inventors of the technology, physicists with more than 10 years experience postdoc or just researching this, including a professor for nanobiotechnology and serial entrepreneur. This year we incorporated, we got first revenues, we got a huge pipeline 
including the world's biggest companies in beverage production, brewing, chemistry, equipment, and food processing equipment. And our ask is two to three million seed round. We're currently 100% founder owned. And with this money, we want to develop a fully scalable product to reach 2 million in revenues in 2024 and then scale uh, much more. Thank you. My question to you, two or three million dollars? I didn't understand what's so much you're raising. Two to three million euros. Euros, okay. Yeah. Please, please make sure you precisely know how much you're raising so it's a kind of confidence you give to investors as well. Okay. Uh, any questions? I'm, I'm not super clear. C can you dumb it down for me? Maybe it's just late in the hour or something. Yeah. What, 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 what do we do? do you Yes, sir. Just dumb it down as, as dumb as you can make mm -hmm. it. We show instead of current microscopy, that's manual where you see a handful of microorganisms and, and you, you have to do manual work. So you can do this once a day if you run a bioprocess like uh, fermentation, beer or other products. We do this 24-7 and can every couple of seconds look at tens of thousands of microorganisms. And the risk when you only look at a handful is you produce a bad product because there's pathogens in it or the wrong uh, microorganisms or they develop in the wrong way because it's still it's living beings. And when this batch goes wrong, you typically have huge costs or in a bad case, uh, you poison customers. And just recently, um, people in Austria died uh, because of food poisoning. And this could have been avoided if you see the microorganisms in your production facility. Yeah, so you're measuring that during production in in line, twenty four seven kind of thing, right? Yeah, and and you are uh, what's the, what's the traction? Are you in production? Are you beta? Do you have any utility of it? Is anybody using it? We sell tiny hardware devices as small as a book that can be easily installed in existing production facilities, and we add this with monthly subscriptions for software as a service. Actually, analysis as a service, where we where we run the machine learning enabled algorithms to detect the right microorganisms. So you are out in the field being used as we yeah. speak. Okay. Yeah. And, and tell me about revenue real quick. Very, very little still. It's just the very first customers, 20,000 yet. Talk to me. I sent you my information. I'm going to give the room to other people to ask questions. Thank you. All right, seems like no more questions. Thank you so much for a nice presentation. And then we're moving to the next speaker. Uh, it, it will be Ben. Thank you. After the Ben, we will have Payom because he mentioned in the chat he was one of the first raising hands. Okay, we will respect that as well. All right, uh, Ben, uh, please go next. Well, thank you so much, guys. Appreciate it. Um, so my name's Ben. I am originally from Denver, but we are based out of New York City. I am in Denver where it dropped 37 degrees in the last hour. Uh, so it's been a little crazy in terms of cold. Um, nonetheless, I run a company known as Gesture. Uh, and basically what we do is we really use uh, advanced AI to really help the consumer and B2B customer uh, send and receive gifts um, basically without the need for any personal uh, recipient information, pretty much no address needed. Uh, to send any sort of gifts, shopping uh, products, those sort of things. Um, and the reason and the way that we do that is we control everything from essentially the checkout process all the way to the last mile logistics process. We own both both sides of the of the um, the equation. So uh, we've been in operation since uh, 2018. Um, we've grown to more than um, delivering in a more than 150 cities now. Uh, we just made our first few deliveries in Canada a couple of weeks ago. And really just the best way to kind of uh, explain this is um, basically take sort of your 1-800-Flowers and, you know, any sort of other shopping experience uh, and combine it with like an Uber type of approach. That's the best way to really explain it. So um, the one of the fun factors around this app is that you can actually break up with someone. It's one of the most used tiles on our app. Um, you can actually break up with someone through the app by sending them dead roses um, or things along those lines. It's pretty wild, um, but it has garnered us quite a bit of attention. So with that said, uh, we're integrated in a lot of the dating apps, a lot of the uh, you know social media platforms. It makes it very easy to ultimately send different types of gifts and products. It's pretty cool. Um, 
numbers real quick. So ultimately we are on track to do about 30, about 3 million in revenue this year. And we basically have projections to do about 30 mil in revenue next year, based on the fact that we are and will be in uh, two additional countries. And we have some contracts that are already in place uh, that put that revenue on the, um, on the map. Uh, so uh, with that said, it's uh, one of those things where it's a social based type of application. It's fun to use. Uh, it's very easy to use and it has become quite popular with, you know, influencers and creators and celebrities and those sort of things. So it's um, been a really fun journey so far. I've uh, just dropped a uh, link in the um, chat for everyone to download the app. Please feel free to do so and use the um, uh, promo code. Uh, uh, basically, I'll, I'll put that in there. It's, um, it's uh, I believe it's GW Sharks. So, uh, and then you can get your some of your last minute gifting out of the way. <laughs> so again, my name's Ben and uh, that's Gesture. That's a very nice promo code, by the way. Thank you so much. Uh, ben, yeah. yeah, Ben, thanks for the presentation. Now, what is the ask that you mentioned that you're making three million? Yeah, sorry about raising? that. Yeah, for sure. Um, basically, uh, just to make this easy, I will, um, give you guys just a quick snapshot of what that looks like. So this is basically- uh, Sorry for that. Sorry for cutting you off. Uh, just to uh, say what is your ask because we usually don't- Yeah, for uh, sure. So, so our ask you. is we've already raised 1.5 million uh, before the pandemic. We're raising an additional 2 million on a safe round uh, and basically uh, the valuation of, of 10 million. And uh, we have about 500,000 under commitment as we speak. Mm -hmm. um, I would be interested to look deeper into what you guys are doing because, you know, you do fit the profile, but uh, your main revenue streams is uh, commission? Yeah, so we, we basically take, uh, we're, we, we're a consumer-based and B2B, so consumer, they purchase at $55 on an average transaction, B2B contracts average about 20000 and then we basically, um, you know, take off the bottom line there. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's connect, let's connect and talk. Definitely, thank you so much, man. Oh, go ahead. Hi, hi Ben. Hi, Ben. It's, it's Duran. So, can you can you walk me through the the, the user journey? So, I, don't, I I I want to send my my wife some flowers because she's mm -hmm. in D.C., her hometown. I'm in Detroit, my hometown, and we're not in L.A. where we live. Had, like like, how does that process actually work? Just yeah, step so by step. super quick. Basically, you would get onto the app, uh, and you would choose what it is that you want to send to her. Uh, now, if you know exactly where she's located, we have two different options basically to use. You can put in the address. We call that old school. Literally, it's called old school in the app. Or if you basically don't know where she is and, you know, let's say it's just uh, you know, a business relationship, you can actually put in what info you have, a phone number or an email, and then the recipient essentially controls the delivery on the other end. So it's really that. That's, that's the part. Th that's yeah. the part that I and 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 the way that I communicate. If I'm actually talking with you, is because I'm more interested. I'm excited. So that's a that's a good sign. Yeah. yeah. So that's the part when you said Uber. I started. So there is a deliverer that actually takes the item to the individual. It's not by mail. Yeah, that's exactly that right. So I have that correctly. Yep. So we have uh, we have over a thousand, as we call them, G runners in the uh, field uh, utilizing our proprietary logistics software. So. It's, it's almost um, when that order comes through, they get pinged, they accept that order, they go out, we tell them where to pick it up, where to drop it off using uh, obviously data, data science and those sort of things. Mm -hmm. So okay, sometimes so we get orders in as little as, uh, as little as 30 minutes to an hour. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the last question for me, as far as, am I audible? Can you still hear me? I, I took my earpods yeah. out. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great, great, thank you. So how do, how do you solve like, the marketplace becoming lopsided? Because a lot of times it's two-sided marketplaces especially when they're infrequent and two people meet each other, they're still human. It's like, Hey, I can deliver this stuff to you. Do you send this regularly? Just take my number. Like what's your strategy there to ensure that your mark marketplace is not lopsided by the very people that drive your marketplaces, your marketplace attempting to undercut you. Yeah. So if I understand correctly, you know, that we, we have essentially went up against your drizzlies and your door dashes and those sort of things. If I understand correctly, um, and it's like where to go, uh, what app to use, those sort of things. But we no, not, that, not mm -hmm. that part, Ben. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm a deliverer. I'm going to mm -hmm. take the flowers. So my wife and I, example, okay. I'm, I'm going to take the flowers to my to to Duran's wife. Mm -hmm. And once I get there and I connect to her, hey, you're a pretty cool person. I really don't like utilizing this app. If you send stuff to your your husband regularly when you're in town, 
here's my number, just contact me. And now I'm outside of your ecosystem when I connect with that person. Like, how do you solve that problem as far as that? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, I, I'd like to give it some more thought and touch base with you offline. We Fair have, enough. yeah, we sort of uh, encountered something very similar um, with, you know, the actual vendors and merchants that we've essentially dealt with and them asking how we're not com- becoming a competitor and then just, you know, customers going straight to them. But um, I, I do believe there is, uh, I had some good thought around that and love to connect with you on that just out of respect for other people, if that's okay. Yeah, I have a reward plan strategy that I talk to entrepreneurs about. I, w- I would love to talk to you about that and just merely just give it to you. Yeah, love it. That'd be great. Okay. Great. I love it. I love the idea. It's pretty cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's move on. We limited on time. Thank you so much for the presentation. Thank and, you. Uh, we had another one. Pre, uh, I don't, uh, Papayom, please, uh, you can speak. Are you there? Hi, Daniel. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm in London right now, moving my wife to America. So I just mm-hmm. want to help her. I just want to get this done. Uh, so um, okay. hello, everyone. Thank you for your time. Um, I am I am the founder and CEO of Unibui. And my company, a good way to think about it, is Indeed Groupon and Pokemon Go had a baby. And uh, it's for college students. So we're an opportunity map for students to explore their local communities and find the missing opportunities that were always around them. They just didn't know existed. Um, The problem is, is that only 1% of local businesses are successful marketing locally. So you can think of it as like the first page of Yelp. Who goes to the second page? Virtually nobody. You want to go to the best place, the best burrito shop. You want to go to the best Japanese restaurant. Um, But that means all the other pages of businesses are virtually lost. Same thing with Google. So we think list views have destroyed pretty much local businesses' opportunities to get in front of people. So we made it super easy for the young demographic of new consumers to see everything around them, from a local job that a local pizza parlor needs to fill to a discount that that local pizza parlor is going to give you. And we put it all in a Google Map and Apple Map API. So uh, very simple. Uh, You used to use uh, bulletin boards back in the day. Um, but now students are using Unibuoy. We launched in February of 2022. Uh, we have around 21,000 users in the platform, around 1,000 daily active users on the platform, and we've made 110K since February, 80,000 of which is a large contract with uh, a local chamber of commerce. Um, and the rest is a lead generation fees that we could charge the local businesses. It's free for students. so. You're pretty much saving money everywhere you go as a student now. So that's we're building this at scale across every city that we possibly can. We're currently located in the Bay Area. And uh, boy, have we done a lot of testing. So our team is great. We're young. We're hungry. Uh, we're raising 500K um, from uh, at, a, at an $8 million uh, evaluation. So And that's a safe. Um, this isn't my first company, but this is my first startup-like company. Uh, I've been in the manufacturing and tech south space before. Um, but yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Are we, are we, are we active? Oh, okay. So I, I didn't I didn't quite can you walk me through the, the, the user journey? I didn't quite get a, sure. a good grasp on I, I I got more of an understanding when you mentioned college students. So perhaps you can utilize them in your example. Just walk me through the product journey. What is, am I going to the Apple store and buying an iPhone? Like what is exactly the product and how does that work? Yeah, so think of it as a Google map, like when you search a restaurant, right? As a student, you want to look for a restaurant, right? But you want to know where you can get a discount. You don't technically just want to look for a restaurant. You want to see where you can find mm-hmm. deals, discounts, where students can get these discounts locally that you don't know exist, right? A lot of businesses have these discounts already in place. They just have nowhere to advertise those discounts and offers, or they need a, like a student to work for their business. So we just put it on a map, on an Apple and Google map overlay. We build our own API layers on Google maps and Apple maps. And then so the students can experience what's actually around them, not look at a list and say, well, I don't know how far that is for me right now. I don't know if that's going to be usable for me right now. So it's a, it's a lot of things. It's not just food. Don't just think about food. Think about like 
you need a tire change. You don't know where to go, okay? You need a smog check. You don't know where to go. You need a new bike. You don't know where to go. Students are really unaware of their surroundings because they're first-time purchasers. And as a recent graduate, I know this feeling because I built this because of me and my friend's problems. We had no idea where to go around it. And so, this isn't just students at my college. It's 90% of students in universities across America. Got it. So really quick, I, I, I get it. So I spent a lot of time at USC. Yeah. They have this MBA yeah. program for entrepreneurs. And Paul Orfala, who's uh, Kinko's, he invited me in for several of his classes to teach alongside him. It's a really laid back, like new thing that they're testing at USC. What I found talking to them, a lot of things that they do is hyper social. So your value proposition, because it sounds like Groupon if they invented a maps, like here are the discounts that are on a maps layer. What stops these, these students from just utilizing Snap Map or the other maps that they have who are connected to each other? Because there's their social proof element. Oh, my friends are going over to this pizza spot. Even if I hate the pizza, I'm going to go there because my friends are actually there. What's your value proposition? Because it, and the reason I'm asking, because what happens if Snap decide to do that? Like, all right, now we're introducing Snap deals and, and you, you, you get Snap deals now in Snap Map. They have the distribution already there. And then they're taking what you're positioning as a company as a small feature subset inside of their product, which is Snap Maps. Yeah, yeah. So, so what you're saying is it's a, it's a great point. So the difficulty is in the user base. The difficulty is supply side. So local businesses are inherently difficult to onboard in general. So although Snap can do something like that, it's much easier for them to buy a company like mine than who already has 400 local businesses in the area than it is for them to just build their own spinoff and then say, okay, let's go to each and every local business. They'll just integrate us into Snap Map. So for us, because our API layers are API layers, we can pretty much implement them in any map with the longitude latitude coordination, if that makes sense. So so if for us, it's not very difficult to integrate within other systems. And we're not trying to recreate things people are doing well. We're actually adding our own new social layers. Like you mentioned, how does it differentiate? We want to create, you know how there's that Frisbee club? Well, you don't know where that Frisbee club is. But they can start posting themselves on our map to build these social constructs that we're talking about here. So it adds that social element, but we're always keeping it to a map. So one more point. Now, do you, is, sure. is this... It, this is my question that's leading to my point. So bear in mind that when you get ready to answer. Really quick response. Is this a separate app that you already have? And that's not my real question, but it's leading to my next question. This is live. The app is live right now on the iOS app store. Got that's it. Really okay. So, yeah. so you excited me when you mentioned <clears throat> that you can build your API layer and tap into the distribution that already exists. So Snap has this yeah. product that you're probably aware of, Snap Minis. So if you can yeah. do, okay, we're going to build on Snap Minis and create a Minis version of our platform for Snap Map and gain that distribution, you see that the JIF company, like uh, I think it's Tenor, they did this and they have yeah. 500 million users just focusing on the keyboard alone. That excites me. So I want to talk to you about this. It just right. really excites okay. me. About these yeah. All right. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we have eight more projects. Uh, I guess no more questions to, uh, to this founder, right? Okay, uh, we have eight more projects. I appreciate that. And uh, let's continue. The, the next one is Ash. Uh, are you, you ready? Yeah, how you doing? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Hey, what's up, ladies and gentlemen? I'm Ash, and all startup investors are going to hate me and love me at the same time. So a majority of startup investors don't know what they're doing when it comes to due diligence. They are highly subjective, highly biased, and don't have tools to do their job properly. And it's causing a lot of wrong investments and low returns. I'm here to save investors from themselves. I'm the CEO of Startup Fuel, an AI-driven diligence software company. We make startup due diligence and valuations easy using data and frameworks. We are a team of angels, VCs, family offices, LPs, and corporate innovation experts, and a PhD in data, in data science and venture capital. We're raising a 1 million round at a 15% dilution. 300K has already been soft committed, and multiple 500,000 leads are reviewing our data room, including Anderson Horwitz. We've signed Techstars as one of our biggest clients um, and have just gotten a contract with Etihad and Emirates Airlines to run their aviation accelerator. Techstars just tripled their contract with us for 2023. The prior head of Morgan Stanley invested in us. We will be oversubscribed in 60 days. We're giving 200K in allocation here to whoever understands what they don't know, they don't know. I studied venture capital um, and valuations and actually worked with many funds accelerators around the world. 
I coach and train new VC fund managers on helping them set up their funds, raise capital from LPs. And I've worked with over 50 startup funds, uh, reviewing over 10,000 startups and 1,000 data rooms. Four years ago, I noticed unethical practices uh, in venture capital, leaving out many founders and lowering deal returns. So we designed Startup Fuel as an AI-driven due, uh, due diligence engine to look at data rooms, comb through decks, financials, and benchmark to the industry, and use now generative AI to automate writing deal memos, valuations, and offer documents that, that are based on the risk of the company. The number one trend in, for VC in 2023 is better due diligence. If FTX was assessed with us, we would have rejected the deal for Sequoia and told them not to go through with it. We are S&P and Moody's for venture diligence. We are building the gold standard on the planet in venture diligence. And I'm dropping my deck and my calendar in the chat uh, and time is ticking, investors. We have 60 days and you will have FOMO of getting into the deal that not only help you as a fund, as an investor to improve yourself, but also to make sure that we get into a large, large revenue month. Thank you and that's my name Lash. Well done, a great, good presentation. Uh, yeah. this is time okay. Of, this is good. Okay. <laughs> well, who, I, I'm sure all of us are ready to take a shot at this. Who wants to go first? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> go for it. <laughs> my, my my question okay, would be I'll, simple. I'll go first. I yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. So, so I hate, time, so let's, let's I hate it, right. and I'm going to move on. Go on, Zen. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh. I, I don't I don't hate it because uh, we do use different tools, you know, in a pitch book and others to uh, to complete our evaluation exercise. But to be honest with you, because there's so many different methodologies, especially when it comes to early stage. My question to you is, you know, how do you train your AI? Because Whenever you have data, whenever you have data rooms, you know, financial models and all the all the metrics, it's understandable. But what do you do on a seed stage? How do you, what kind of algorithm will evaluate if this founder can be a champion or not? So we actually infuse many different uh, things like personality assessments, code review, background checks. There's some things that turn intangible data into tangible evidence. And then we've had now 40 years worth of uh, data from PitchBook, Crunchbase, all these platforms that we've got the grant to build prediction engine to find unicorns. So comparing this data extracted from these documents and engines, comparing it to the history of startups and predicting which companies will be the best chance for unicorns based on that investor who's investing in them. I'm, oh, I'm oh. definitely interested to look into this, but you know, of course, there's a lot of questions. But go ahead, Dora. Yeah, go for it. Okay, I like you as a person. I really like you. You're confident, and I'm sure we can have a great time, like out, out in the real world. But let's let's really dive into this. Okay, it sounds as if you're saying you are going to be able to make a really strong postulation. In fact, even leaning towards actively a, a determination that you can ensure that due diligence is better for fund managers like ourselves. Okay, that's one thing. But like, how do you actually know? So I have a background in the music industry. When I'm in the studio mixing in a song in Pro Tools and I have to add a certain like plug in to a particular vocal, I don't know if it should be another layer added. And then the song is packaged, it's sent to Universal Music Distribution. Interscope has to communicate with them. Then there's this startup that come over and say, hey, we're going to ensure that this song can be played a billion times. You're telling me, this AI has such strong knowledge or whatever system you've built that it's going to ensure, and this is just one part of my, my, my I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to be quick, but it's just funny, that this AI is going to know that this song or this investment I'm going to make in this music platform, platform is going to have success, whereas success in the music industry has less to do with hardcore mathematical heuristics and it's more so of psychology and maneuvering of, of investment from big, big record companies. Like how do you actually get into the cultural cachet of what makes these things actually work? And I, now before you answer, I'll give an example. When Mike Maples uh, from Floodgate Ventures, he invested in Evan Williams when they built Twitter. He said, Evan walked in and said, hey, you need to take your money back from our last idea we were losing. I don't want my money back, Evan. But I'll take it back if you let me invest in your new thing. What's your new thing? He said, well, we built this platform and let you say what you're doing. In hindsight, that's a very great way to explain Twitter. He said, what's the revenue model, Evan? We don't have a revenue model. So what's the business model? We don't have a business model. We figure if a million people do blogs, 10 million people would do micro blogs. The onus of proof are on the people that are negative. How would your algorithm have known that Twitter was going to be so successful? When Mike Maples even admitted himself, he didn't know. He just believed in the fact that Evan had a really good sense on where microblogging was going to go, so he made the investment. I'm really attempting to understand, like, what you have, what have you figured out that the rest of us haven't? So 
So first of all, um, we actually didn't build this entire engine. A PhD professor who wrote his dissertation in eliminating subjective bias in VC diligence wrote this, and he actually defended it looking at over 30,000 in uh, investments and backtracked it and said, what has been characteristics about these that make sense? Now, there are going to be obviously outliers that don't make sense in an engine, but this is a power law game. What we're doing is we're trying to use mathematics and quants to figure out where the risk is, uh, is assessed in companies and allowing investors to look at more deals at the top end of their pipeline, use data and signals to highlight which companies they should take meetings with, we, we should move to different stages with. And most importantly, we are now have access to a layer of data and engines that a lot of investors don't because we sit as a third party neutral bias organization. That's what we call ourselves S&P and Moody's. So a lot of the data that we've already trained from PitchBook, you're not realizing that investors are highly subjective and are making mistakes. The problem, the thing is that now we hit a tipping point in VC data that we have patterns and trends over the last 40 years that allow us to determine who the next best fit of that model will be and be able to better assess those companies for different characteristics. Team, traction, market has all different categories. How do we take it and build Moneyball for VC by breaking out different characteristics of a company, ranking and rating each one of them, and assess assessing investors, which one are you good at helping with? So it's not necessarily about finding the best company, it's the best fit. If the investor is good in sales or tech marketing, we want to pair them with the companies that are strong in everything else, but weak in those areas. That's how we're building a global dominant engine. If you built a better algorithm to explain to me if I should utilize a, a, a specific reverb plugin for a song. I understand that <clears throat> because you're analyzing the actual auditory elements of the software, but you're talking about understanding humans. You can literally have a company that's on the prospects of being a billion dollar company. And by the way, being a unicorn does not guarantee that the company is going to get to a, a, a liquidity event. It's a lot of companies that face down rounds, they, they, they run out of like money, all type of stuff. That's just a matter of evaluation metric. But to, someone can literally lose their mother and just completely say, I'm not interested in this business anymore. And they were a unicorn yesterday. Like, how does your AI factor into just human, just us being humans in general? Again, if you were saying this AI works from a heuristic perspective, where mathematically, you can figure out how to help this, this, this company invent a strategy to get from $1 million to $3 million in revenue, then now we're talking. But you don't know tomorrow if I'm just going to want to jump off the top of a building and my company goes down. So I'll talk exactly like actuarial science and insurance does. So insurance cannot, no matter what policies they write, they cannot predict who's going to jump off the cliff tomorrow. But what they're doing is they're using power law dynamics to try to win as many times as possible. And that's the game here. The game is using as much data and information available to make decisions that are more outliers than before. And it has right now back tested an 85% confidence to determine who should not get money. I have to talk to you off, offline. Like we have to, we have to dive a bit deeper on this. <laughs> I got to tell you, but thanks, I appreciate it. It's, no it's, it started bowling in here, guys. So we got to move to the next project. And thanks for actually raising the temperature in this room. Um, uh, so uh, we have seven more projects uh, to go, and uh, this is another question to investor because I said half an hour, and it's half an hour past. Are we continuing uh, looking at the projects, or are we wrapping this up? I'm okay. I, I would give a chance to people, you know. To All right. Yeah, I'm fine. I'm yeah. here. I'm fine. I'm here. Yeah. Um, Let's go for it. I'm going to say happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Bless it to all of you. Daniel, great job. If you're listening, subscribe to his service. I just did. $60 a year for what he does is a steal. So get on the damn platform. Put your $60. Give him what beast, the, 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 the boost he wants. And lots of love to you, Mr. Daniel. Great work. As Thank you so Thank much. You we just, I just left, I just left, just to mention, I left the link uh, for us, for the plants and everything uh, on the chat. So everybody who's interest, interested can take a look at it. Thank yeah. You. Uh Thank you, Lichazar. Thank you so much, uh, Jordan, for participating. New, really New Year's party at Zammer's house. Uh, it is listed on 235 First Street, San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you guys. Take care. Take care. Thank you for participating. We look forward to seeing you again. Happy holidays. Take care. You too. All right. Let's continue. Uh, um, uh, let's just let's Who's next? Okay. So we have Anna from Insimo AI. Anna, are you here? Anna, founder and CEO of Insimo AI. Can you hear me well? Yes. Uh, so the company that increases revenue of game companies with AI products. 
this autumn, I talked to more than 20 user acquisition leads, and all of them confirmed that it hurts 10 out of 10 to create performing ads creative. That's why we created Smart UA. It's a platform with AI generated video creatives, which boosts 10 times ROAS. My partner has been developing algorithm for five years and it doesn't have analogs right now. He validated it with four out of four successful clients where increased their metrics 10 times. Up to today, uh, we signed three contracts and uh, 15 more in negotiation. And actually it really looks like a product market fit because everyone I talked to from the industry, they really wanna try our solution. And in December, we earn $3,500. And also, Ixola and Epsflar have thousands of clients in games considering investments in us right now. And we need just 2,000 games to become a unicorn. It sounds amazing. So our business model is $200 per idea, and it's around 4,000 per game per month. We have a great market and it's becoming $235 billion by 2028. And also we are going to earn 28 million in 2024. We have a dream team. I'm personally two time founders and one year and a half helps game, game developers increase their revenue. Advised more than 100 startups and help them to increase money and go to accelerators. My co-founder, Victor, he uh, has developed an algorithm for five years. He knows everything in the industry uh, about production of uh, creatives for games. And Alex, he, he is an email architect who worked for Amazon and other companies where built successful email products. So now we already closed 850K and need uh, 300k to reach the KPI from A16Z they set for us uh, and to close our round A in 2023. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, Anna, good to see you. I've been you know, following your project and we know each other and I know uh, your family for quite uh, 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 several years. Now, uh, great progress. Uh, what I wanted to hear a little more is can you elaborate on the monetization? You know, how do you monetize? You know, walk walk me through the process here of uh, you know whose whose problem you're solving and how you're getting paid for that. We solve problem of user acquisition leads or similar of game companies, mobile game companies. It's our main target. So uh, they just buy uh, at least twelve and up to fifty ideas for their creatives, or we also sell creatives like a whole process because we have uh, our partners and in the future it will be a marketplace. Uh, so they buy as many ideas or creatives as they want and we charge for per one, $200. So, so is, is it your team that actually helps to create those you know little advertisement videos or you have a, you know, bunch of uh, freelancers working for you. It's, it's, so it's like a platform marketplace kind of thing. Okay, so our product is AI create generated ideas, AI generated. textual descriptions. So our main product is IT, scalable, super fast and so on. And we have partners, bunch of partners uh, who uh, create creatives for our clients and we charge uh, our commission from them. Mm -hmm. And also we have a cabinet where clients get all, all of these descriptions, uh, creative and just can uh, check the progress there. So, so you mentioned your your your, your revenue targets. Can, can you repeat those again? Our revenue targets: it's mobile game companies, uh, which earn at least uh, forty thousand per per month. I can say, but usually it's huge enterprises. They have three million DAO users they top three in the uh, u.s market so we're right now negotiation with companies like this no what i meant was how, how much revenue are you anticipating you you mentioned a, a year a year target of, of a total amount of revenue 
I just, I just don't remember what exactly that was. That seventy billion dollars. It's our TAM. <clears throat> so that's your TAM. Yeah. Okay. So so what do you anticipate your revenue is going to be within the next eighteen months? Okay. So as I said, we are going to earn twenty eight million dollars in twenty twenty four. Okay. And, and what's the cost of capital on that on, on that revenue? Uh, cost per capital. Sorry, I don't get it. Okay, so cost of capital is a metric. I, I would you can find that just when you get a chance, Google cost of capital because when you said twenty twenty four, you're going to generate twenty four million dollars. I would imagine for the other investors here, twenty twenty four is around the corner. And any startup that was able to do that that fast, it's an incredible startup. <laughs> So, oh, okay, I, 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 I can explain my calculation, probably it will help. So uh, from our one game, we earn 4,000. Yeah, so we need just around uh, 40 clients to earn 1 million. And also we have in our CRM around 100 clients who are waiting our cases and they have at least three games and two friends, so 600 clients. And we can earn from these 600 clients multiply 4,000, multiply 12, it's $28 million in 2024. Is it the answer? Yeah, I mean, it, it, you really thought about the, the, the metrics behind how you justify the total number, but actually getting there and ensuring that you can execute on making that realization is a totally different perspective. But again, I, I want you to really think about the, the, the cost of the capital, because that's going to be the calculation of the minimum return to justify the actual budgeting. So if, you, if you're saying that, hey, we're going to make $28 million, or we're gonna make $24 million in, in the next, I, I suppose, 12 months, or 2024, how much capital is it going to take for you to get to that revenue target? Because it's going to cost a certain amount of capital to even reach $24 million in revenue. Then the next question would be, okay, what's going to be your EBITDA? Are you going to operate at a net revenue negative? It's, it's more than just saying, hey, this is the opportunity that we have. <clears throat> I would tell people this back in the day when we sold CDs out of the trunk. They say, hey, if I just sold five CDs at $10 a CD, I can make $50. So, yeah, but the CDs cost. Some may break. Some people may want to return. I want you to just add that inside of your calculations as how do you actually get to making that revenue a realization? What, how much is it going to cost you to actually make that revenue realization and factor that into your model? Because it's obviously, a, you're pretty smart and thought about this, but those are the things okay. that I'm really interested in. Because again, if I hear $24 million from a startup in one year, that's, that's pretty so, impressive. So, so if, if I correctly understand you, we have burn rate 50,000 per month per team. And we already have uh, clients in our CRM system, which we can uh, go to them and just, sell our product because right now, as I said, almost everyone want to try our solution. And we already get super excited feedback from our current client. Maybe I, I don't get something. Let's move on. Zamir had a question. Uh, it wasn't a question. It was just to elaborate a little on, on what uh, Rena was saying. You know, a good capital consumption uh, ratio is, you know, if you raise a million dollars and out of that, you can make Two million or two and a half million in new revenue. That's a really good capital consumption uh, ratio. Uh, best companies in the market, you know, do that uh, when they're in uh, early stages. So um, uh, just uh, look, look. Uh, some some links were posted here by Daniel. Uh, this is all like a matter of proper financial planning. You know, with your financial model, uh, how much. Uh, money you're going to be raising at this moment, what's going to be your marketing and sales strategy, how many people you're going to hire, etc. So there's a lot of numbers that got to be put into the system uh, in order to justify the you know um, big big revenue that uh, you're targeting. I like the ambition, honestly. I like when when startups uh, say, "Hey, you know, we're ambitious. We're going to reach this level level of revenue." But it has to be realistic, and everything else has to align, like your marketing, your your hiring strategy, your uh, you know fundraising strategy. Everything has to be in place in order to get to that you know milestone, and it has to be believable. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, just one uh, little announcement. Uh, just uh, please don't use uh, virtual backgrounds, otherwise you'll be hidden from uh, from this room. So uh, I want you to be visible as well. Actually, I didn't use. So uh, no, you were possible. you were visible, not visible. Ah, green background. Don't use green background setting. That's important. All right. 
Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Uh, uh, let's just ask the floor is yours. We cannot hear you, man. Sorry, sorry for that. Adam? Yeah, yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Go. Yes, go for it. Okay, uh, nice to meet everyone. Happy holidays. Thank you for your time. <clears throat> okay. Um, uh, my name is Adam Mars. I started a company called Glowstick. Uh, I have approximately 20 years in the telecommunication space. Um, I'm a two-time founder. My last business did fairly well. I took a $3,000 investment, turned it to almost $8 million in three years. My largest customer was Masayoshi-san of SoftBank. The only reason I think that's important is because I demonstrates I have uh, expertise, um, some tenure in the business. And in the 20 years I was building cellular networks, I learned something very important. And cellular phones um, do wonderful things to globalize opportunities, but they crush local, local opportunities. You kind of have to mine through um, all of the opportunities um, just to find things that are local. So when I started this company, <clears throat> I did a lot of forensics and research and I came to the conclusion that, that, we, that mankind in general needs a new way to mobilize. And so we invented a technology called Glowstick that's primarily map first, it's convenient first, and it works like a walkie-talkie on the web. So you basically open up our PWA. Um, there's no installation process. It works much like Google Maps. Uh, it asks you one simple question, is there anything you want? And you type in what you want, and it goes through our patented maps. Um, currently, we have about nine patents on file. We've just acquired our first utility patent. <clears throat> and then we... Um, offer visualization areas of opportunity. So if I typed in looking for a nightcap or if anything I type in, it becomes basically like Slack on a map. And it allows people to connect in the moment in real time. When I started this process, I thought location cloaking was clever and there was a lot of clever ways to do it. But what I started to discover is that executing maps at this level, trying to put a million or 10 million people on a map in constant time or somewhere in the range of 500 milliseconds is very challenging. So as an example, when you look at Snap, they, they do something very similar, but they don't offer a semantic map, uh, a semantic match. So in Glowstick, it's very easy. You open up a map, you type in what you want, and you can communicate with the whole concert, with the whole festival. Um, basically anywhere, anytime you can communicate. All of our messages are less than eight hours old. Um, uh, they are rooted in communication channels. So if you type in vegan Denver Fashion Week um, travel, that we match you in real time and it'll show you areas of opportunity and those message boards become little visualization lava dots on a map. If everyone goes to the chat, uh, you'll see um, <clears throat> an example of what I'm talking about. It'll kind of offer some more clarity. Um, but in general, that's that's my general pitch. We're looking at uh, 5.8 million uh bottom of Q2 or bottom of Q1 of next year, we're, we'll be done with MVP. We've raised 750 to date. Uh, our burn rate's very low. We have a team of about 15 people. Uh, we've completed an FTO. We're primarily an intellectual property company. In my last company, um, I litigated against a publicly traded company. So what I tell people is not only can I invent and write patents with our team, but we can litigate IP and you'll, very, you'll find very few people that can do that. Uh, I did see one of my previous uh, founders make mention that they were looking to put opportunities on a map. And I would say, um, be very careful um, on what you're trying to build because maps are a very sensitive engine, but they're very, very powerful. So that's what I got. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions from the sharks? Uh, and What's your you... customer acquisition cost? Customer acquisition cost uh, with the 5.8 million would be around 80 cents a customer. And the way we're gonna go to market is we're starting from cultural epicenters. So if you look at our performa, we're targeting from March all the way to the end of summer, in which we hit places like South by Southwest, Coachella, Comic Con. We show up with uh, VIP buses that offer our VIP experience. We can onboard you in the app in less than eight seconds. And as I tell people, McDonald's doesn't sell burgers, they sell convenience. And so if you're trying to offer people opportunity in the moment, you better deliver a value proposition in less than eight seconds. And so I can onboard a thousand people in less than eight seconds and get them on the same communication channel. So that was part of our secret message. We, we're gonna uh, approach these cultural epicenters not only with a vehicle to give them shuttle rides back and forth to to and from where they're coming, but uh, drinks, water, and we can onboard you with a QR code. And since there's no installation, 
Um, it's really quite simple. By the time we deliver our MVP, you go to glowstick.com or glowstick.io or glowstick.ai, all of which we've trademarked. And uh, we can get a thousand people on the same channel hyper, hyper, hyper fast. What's the, what's the business model? Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, so there's three ways you're going to make money in this space. Ads, my, my theory, ads suck. Uh, I get tired of being exploited for ads. I don't need to mind your cookies because you just told me what you want. Two, subscriptions are lame in my opinion too. I got so many things sucking on my account. I'm really not interested and I think there needs to be a new paradigm. So fundamentally, our goal is to get somewhere between 500,000 and a million people on the app and pivot to a digital wallet. Because in, in general, if we're bringing people together in the moment for opportunities, that micro fees offer the lowest friction rate for users. When a user gets microfeed by a credit card company, they feel as almost zero friction. So in theory, you can put Slack on a map and you could put Venmo on a map and you get a visualizer. And I would say a big example of that is when Amazon sells you their supply chain services. They don't put UPS up front because they are the cash register. They will put their supply chain services first. So in theory, uh, our goal is to get people on the dance floor and then start monetizing it through a digital wallet. Quick, quick question, Adam. So is the service a, a chat framework or you're providing an interface for an out-of-the-box map for different services? Um, so basically it works like this. You ever been to Google Maps? Yes, of, of course. I like Apple Maps better, because, <laughs> but I've been on Google Maps. Well, Google Maps, Apple Maps is way better because it's a vector engine and I think they're stunning and beautiful and they only own 10% of the market share. So we love Apple Maps for that reason. You just can't customize color. But to answer your question, if you went to your map and you could type in anything you wanted and then that automatically semantically matched with any other human being on planet Earth and you can pinch zoom and see areas of opportunity and you can tap on it in one click, basically it's that simple. You go on a map, it's, it's like Google search with human beings in the moment. And I would also dare say to any engineer trying to to deliver that in constant time is very hard. That's why you don't see it. We spent a year engineering all these solutions. And right now we can put 10 million people on a map and represent those 10 million people on a map in constant time, or our target is 500 milliseconds with no, with no so, geofencing. Are, are you familiar? I, I, I understand much more now. Are you familiar with UMAP? UMAP, no, I'm not. Yeah, so it's a social mapping platform and their premise is pretty clean UI. They, they took the app off the app store and then they relaunched it. It's, it's active now. And, and their, their value proposition is that, hey, we want to socialize the map. So they're more like Snap, like Snap. And it sounds as if you are taking the map experience and providing solutions in real time. My wife and I utilize maps all the time, attempting to find a vegan spot in Los Angeles because we're like super vegan. And it would be nice if, if I can, you know, type inside of a map and then get connected with you and you say, maybe it's a pre-recorded video. Like, hey, this is a great vegan spot and this is why I actually did it. So I can understand how it would be different from a UMAP or a SNAP map. But what's your distribution strategy? Is the ultimate strategy for you to have a separate map? I heard, I heard the wallet thing, that can just be an ancillary service to your ultimate service. Is your ultimate strategy that you have an independent map or are you going to create the, the, the framework that you can place inside of different maps? So we, we have, Obviously we can't answer all the questions, but in general, we do have a B2B model where if we wanted to interlace this with Live Nation, if we wanted a, a white label layer, we could do that. And we've, we've architected our maps to do that. But being those customer acquisition costs are very high. I came from enterprise. Uh, my last business, my customer acquisition costs were about 80 grand per customer. It's a grind. And in, in my preference is to basically start from a cultural epicenter and offer that value proposition to consumers, to mobilize consumers in the moment. That in general, human beings fail to mobilize anymore. So our general goal is to go consumer, consumer, uh, B2C first. And if, if we're struggling there, we can go B2B. And, and I have a million ways to do that. I have 10 years doing large billion dollar deals. Um, my resume is pretty extensive. Um, but in general, my preference is to go straight punk rock, go straight, you know, I'm vegan as well. So, you know, I want to be able to type in, you know, vegan rock bar. And, and I want to know what's up right now. And I want to mobilize my crew. And I want to know where my tribe is. And That's... if you want to get a really clear understanding, 
click the link and you'll see very quickly in about 10 seconds, you'll start to understand what we're talking about. Okay, we are moving well, uh, would, would, up until to three, three hours. Feel, feel yeah. free to connect in the chat because uh, we are, like I mentioned, we are moving to three, uh, three hours and uh, I would like to continue with the next one. Uh, sorry for interrupting like that, but uh, time is ticking. We are moving to Ken Partica, small structures. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you too. Ken Partica, you're muted. Hello. Hello, Ken. Hello. Go for it. You can see me, hear me? Yes, but uh, stop moving, please, and uh, let's concentrate on the pitch. Sure. My name's Ken Partica. I'm located in Edmonton, Canada, and we're all about building small, affordable structures. So what we're looking to do is we have a few, like three primary structures that are optimized for certain market segments. And by using those three primary designs, I believe we can more efficiently and effectively put out products because we're very focused on just three main units. And those units would be modular and they would be able to be, you know, formed together to form larger units. We would also be incorporating a, large, a, a lot of vertical into our designs. Um, so they're gonna be very modular, interchangeable, vertical. Um, and then what we're ultimately doing is we want to set up a facility to build these structures. We have a lot of people interested and we think we can pump out quite a few initially. And then as soon as we've gotten our designs down, then we want to actually start focusing on developing campgrounds, which we can populate. So that's really our primary target. This would be more getting the structures designed and built, pricing everything down to go to the next stage, which would be like campground developments. So what is your ask? We didn't hear the money that you oh, would like sorry. to do. Yeah, yeah, we're looking for a 420,000 seed investment. So okay. can I ask Questions? a question? Can, yeah, so this sure. uh, sounds like a, like a prefabricated uh, structures, right? Are, are these houses, yeah. are these cabins? What are these? What are you talking about? These would be, depending on where you want to locate them, would determine what they would be categorized as. So our structures, you could put them in a backyard of a residential place where they would be classified as an accessory dwelling unit, but you could put that same structure in a campground, in which case it would be classified as a recreational vehicle, you know, or if it was a manufactured park, it would be classified as a manufactured vehicle. So it's a, it's a vehicle or it's 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 a it's a structure building it's a building what it's a building it? if it was used in a campground and classified as a recreational vehicle it would more specifically be categorized as a park model recreational vehicle or a cottage okay cottage so that so would be the what is what is the technology here you have some unique technology you know, you you have your own factory to do the prefabrication, or you guys are just designers and architects that created we these. Building. I'm sorry. We would be building the units, and we would be seeking some IP related to design patents. Okay, so doesn't doesn't look to me as as a venture capital type of business. To be honest with you, it looks like a typical you know construction business. So I'm not sure if we would be a fit, for instance, you know, to invest in something like this. Yeah. Um, well, the actual, you know, construction. I, I, uh, sorry for interruption. I agree with that. Uh, it's just uh, uh, if you want to fit a venture, uh, venture investors model, uh, just th there is a quick recommendation so you can uh, follow or not. So if you uh, want venture investors money, you need to have a scalable model that can scale with a very little team. 
And uh, with your project, it seems like to build more and uh, construct more of this, you would need to increase the team and you would need cash for that. It's just one of the things uh, the investors would be looking at. So if you won't go that direction, just come with the right business model that would fit venture investors, they will be interested to look at that. Right now, it looks like a traditional model business, which is good. I mean, it doesn't have to be bad or something. You are doing a great well, job. Well, there is a scalability element to it. Like it's very scalable. Okay, just uh, yes, I would like to interrupt. Sorry for that interruption, but uh, we would like we would have to move. We're three hours and more than three hours actually now, and I would like to to ask uh, Miss Charm. I think that's Johan. Are you Johan with that uh, nickname? Johan. Hi. Next time, please use your name. <laughs> Hello. Um, my name is Miss Charm. Okay, okay, so uh, my mistake, that's, just, that's your real name. So go for your pitch, please. Turn on your video, please. Yes, turn on um, your video. It says you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. Okay, so yeah, that's, so probably we'll move with our, with our other presenter, Sami Sadiq. Sami? Yep, yeah. hey everyone. Um, I'll just jump right in in the interest of time. My name is Sami Sadiq and I'm the founder and CEO of Sea Alive. We have a platform for real-time use of applications for small and large audiences. So it's a real-time synchronization framework for apps where you can use apps together. The simplest example is being able to watch movies together while interacting with others. But we have other apps such as um, games and there are apps for commerce uh, as well as for uh, education. So our customers currently include Paramount Pictures, Fox, um, iHeartMedia, a number of independent studios out of LA. And then we also have uh, customers on the enterprise side like ADB, Bosch Jagger, um, Formula E, the World Health Organization. And um, on the education side, we have customers such as uh, Oxford Learning. Uh, we've engaged users for over 5 million hours on our platform. We've hosted over 35,000 events, all with zero marketing spend. Um, what we have in terms of technology is a content delivery network uh, capable of broadcasting and latencies of under 250 milliseconds, along with a synchronization framework for apps. On top of which, we have built a layer for managing users and apps. On top of which, you can build collaborative apps. Um, on our platform, we are building a marketplace on which influencers can come on, pick out content apps and products, and go shopping or do things together with uh, users. Um, the global market size for this is 94,000, sorry, 94 billion with adjacent markets in e-commerce and the creator economy. Our business our revenue model uh, includes two streams. One is managed services, in which case we charge a licensing fee of 200,000 along with a subscription fee. Uh, and on the, we also have a sell service model, in which case we take a percentage of all the transactions that happen. So far, we've generated uh, $700,000 since our alpha launch in 2020. Uh, for next, we have an annual recurring revenue of uh, $100,000. And by next year, we expect our revenues to jump up to 6 million um, as we launch self-service. And as we expand to additional territories, we expect to go to 18 million in revenue. Uh, the platform is enabling viral. Every user brings in 2.4 friends on average. Um, we have four issued patents. And we also have a concept of friends, so it's difficult for people to search out. We're a team of uh, 12 people. We, um, um, a lot of them are engineers with, all, with extensive expertise in broadcast technologies and scaling out uh, platforms. As for myself, I have a PhD in computer vision and AI, and I've had startups in the past. So yeah, so that's a quick intro onto, on, on CLI. So you uh, said that it will grow 60 times uh, within one year. Like what, what would be the uh, reason of uh, growing so fast? So the main reason is launching self service. So, so far, when customers came to us, we were kind of involved in the setup process. But once we launch self service, we will become a platform in the true sense, just like Uber is a platform on which other people can uh, drive cars or Airbnb is a platform on which other people can um, rent out their properties. We become a platform and it's all hands off. So we're not involved in the setup process. It's because of automation that we expect to get this. At the same time, we also have a few um, sales deals in the pipeline. Uh, Sammy, hi. So um, interesting uh, to look at you guys. So let's connect, but uh, where are you located? Where is the 
uh, entity registered? Uh, we're in uh, Toronto, Canada. Okay. And, and the whole team is there or you're all over the place? Um, um, so we have a second office in Regina uh, and, and I'm also in LA frequently. Okay, and what's your core market? Um, and so, so it's a consumer-facing platform. Oh, um, yeah, what, what is your core right market? We're focusing on North America. North America. Okay, yeah. uh, let's connect. Uh, I, uh, for the sake of time, I don't want to ask you too many questions right now sure. about the technology, the model, etc. So, uh, connect to me, and we'll uh, look into it more. Okay, sounds good. Why do you why do you guys uh, incorporate it in Canada? Will you incorporate in Delaware? Uh, yeah, we're looking at uh, incorporating in Delaware in the future, especially as we raise larger rounds uh, from the U.S. and elsewhere. So that's not an issue. Okay, uh, talk to Lechazar about that. He can he can help you with that. All right. Uh, do you, uh, Duran? Do you have a question, Yuan? No, no, I don't. Okay, we continue. You're right. speechless. <laughs> uh, so uh, again, uh, Mrs. Sharm, uh, please uh, go next. Uh, again, can you hear? Can you speak? Hi, my name is Charm. Um, I am a user of Fanbase. I'm a content creator there, and I just want to thank you guys for giving me the opportunity to be on your platform because I'm not here by coincidence. I'm here by chance, and I want to thank Duran for inviting me here. So I have an idea about um, country therapy, and it's um, based off the family tree of ghetto therapy where I provide some type of um, nonprofit service to people on social media sites. Um, some of the services includes listening to music, meditation, vetting, and pitching their business ideas on social media. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Is, is ghetto therapist a name of the startup? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I got to turn my volume up. I could barely yeah, yeah. hear you. The, what did you say? So you had a s signature next to your name. It said ghetto therapist. Is that a, the name of the startup? That would, that would, yeah, that would be the name of my nonprofit foundation. Um, I will be the ghetto therapist. Um, just a little background. Um, three years ago, I attempted suicide and I have a mental disorder and I'm not coming out wanting to uh, make a big profit as far as um, making money or making it a business. It's more just like a support team that I want to um, launch. So so, so this is a, a mental health type of a, a project, like helping other people? Yes, you know, yes. With their, yes uh, mental problems will mm -hmm. you have any kind of technology backing this up like what are you trying to build here like a platform um, so a mobile on, app or something you know that so on, I, basically i just want to put the word out there um this is my business um i create revenue on fan base by um posting content and i um like money like like hearts, I can buy hearts. People can give me hearts. Right now, my revenue is at $20 in two months. And by creating content, I have built up $20 for myself. So the content that I create will be a source of income for me. I see. So, you know, it's it's probably important to note here that, you know, if you're planning to raise capital from like a venture investors or business angels, uh, mm -hmm. You gotta have uh, some kind of uh, technology behind uh, the idea that you're trying to implement, you know. Or and it's always good to have a bigger mission, you know, to help people to to solve a large mm -hmm. problem for a big group of uh, people in need. But if there's no technology backing this up, or there's no some kind of a strong methodology, you know, a science behind it, it's gonna be very hard to raise money from a venture capitalist because this is what we're looking for not just an individual with a talent and idea, but also is there a scalable tech 
that could be used like a platform, a mobile app, or, you know, SaaS, anything, software uh, that could be used to uh, reach uh, big numbers of people and scale, you know, uh, drastically. Like, and like to that. add so, on to what you're hold saying, on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Get up, get up, get up, one second. So, Z Z Zamir, mm -hmm. I'm on a platform, a social network, Zamir, called Fanbase. So, Fanbase is a social media platform. It has an audio feature similar to Clubhouse. And <clears throat> it's, a, it's a big network that I mentor and coach on the platform, and I invited them over. What she's doing, really, <clears throat> she's more on the influencer side, where she wants to take her story and spread it to people. But I like the fact that she has the confidence to communicate in front of you all. She's not seeking an investment or oh, okay. a startup. She's from that community. That of people that I talk to on a daily basis. So maybe just advice on how to get her word out, how to better utilize so, LinkedIn. Sure. Is, is, that, that, is it a text type of content or is it a voice, is it a podcast? What kind of content is it? It's, it's voice. It's, it's so it's, they have, like you can post on there like Instagram. They have their, mm -hmm. their, their competitor to suit rails. They call it flips. Good, but good. Got, primarily got it. it's the audio side. Primarily now, it's the audio side. I have, a, I have a perfect answer for you. So there is a startup called OSA, O-S-S-A. I recently looked at it. And so there's a, a team of a female entrepreneurs that support other female podcasters with a smaller audiences. And they help monetize the content of those podcasters. So take a look at their website, O-S-S-A. I think this would be probably one of the good uh, ideas to help you spread the word and uh, monetize the content yes. that you're already creating in your influence uh, audience. So try that. And Mr. Zamir, and Mr. Zamir I do want to say that I am like, I do have a lot of ideas and I would like to sell my ideas if that's something that can be done one day, because I have like a whole business plan and format and things like that it's kind of not like a question it's kind of like a statement that i have yeah. so i understand so uh it, it, to to reply to this uh there's a lot of ideas flowing out there well you, typically you know ideas don't sell as as just an idea stage uh but oh, if, you okay. can, if you can package it if you can you know come up with a business model supporting this idea and if you uh you know manage to find other people to join you with this idea so that's something that could be uh, interesting to very early stage investors say, hey, I believe in this, you know, in this idea, in this group and in this model. Here is some uh, initial investment to build this up. But you got Yeah, that's what I want. Thank you. Better. Let's move on. Uh, thank you so much, guys. Uh, and uh, I think we achieved another milestone today with uh, helping uh, not yet an entrepreneur uh, with uh, impact uh, who is uh, trying to create some impact. And uh, I really like, thank you. Thank you guys for doing this. Um, we have two more uh, entrepreneurs left and uh, we will wrap this up right after. So let's keep this short, uh, especially investors, please make it short as well. <laughs> I'm joking, but do it as you, as you have to do. Um, and uh, uh, Kirill Kurochkin, please go next. Can you hear us, Kirill? Yeah, yeah, uh, I can hear you. Wait a second, I'm gonna okay. unwrap my camera. All right. Uh, can Can you see me? Yes. Go for it. Two minutes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, two minutes started. So uh, my name is Kirill, and I'm building the global recruitment platform for Simon. So my business is not that high tech, uh, but uh, uh, two things you should know about Simon is that uh, they work in short short term contracts, uh, four to ten months, and uh, every one or two years, Simon changes his job. So basically, uh, and uh, it's it's one fact. And second fact is that all the Siemens in the world they adhere to same certification system. So if you have a ship uh, on any position of this ship, you can hire Siemens from all across the world. So uh, it doesn't matter uh, he's coming from Australia or Mexico states. Uh, so that's why. Every time employer, uh, he have to solve this equation of uh, uh, I'm gonna bring the cheapest seaman from Philippines, uh, but uh, the tickets to get him on a ship gonna cost more. Or I can bring someone from Egypt who's gonna cost more, but uh, the tickets gonna uh, cost less. And uh, my business is global by definition because uh, I work uh, in a, a maritime industry and uh, uh, the ships are uh, traveling between countries. So uh, I don't have a uh, focus on any one single country. I'm trying to uh, solve the equation for uh, the world. Uh, on our platform, 
uh, we have already more than 100, uh, 100 uh, 80,000 uh, 80, uh, Siemens. Uh, we acquired them for less than one dollar each. We are very, uh, our superpower is user acquisition. So basically uh, more than 100,000 uh, 100, uh, users required for like $10,000. Uh, if you're gonna take at our business model, so basically uh, it's a standard uh, model of any recruiting platform. So uh, the, the, guy, the guys who, uh, who, want, uh, who wants to man their ships, who want to hire Simon, they usually pay. Uh, Simon don't pay anything. Uh, close your presentation, please wrap it up. Ah, okay, uh, uh, wrap it up, yeah. Uh, we are raising $2 million on $8 million valuation. Uh, we already raised uh, in previous round uh, more than $600,000. Uh, we are in incorporated in Delaware and in, uh, in Dubai. And uh, in this round, we uh, our main focus is uh, VC funds from uh, in the Pacific region, but uh, we're gonna accept uh, any other funds as well. Thank you. Okay, Kirill, hi. Uh, interesting uh, presentation. Thank you. Uh, so you mentioned that you have 180,000 uh, people and the model is pretty clear, you know, it's HR rec recruiting platform. What is your current uh, revenue for 22? Uh, for 22, it's uh, almost uh, more than $30,000. Uh, last month, we, uh, we did $12,000. And uh, so our main, uh, so the main reason of uh, why we are doing this round is because 60% uh, of, uh, of vacancies of position uh, to which employers post on our, uh, on our platform, they have less than three responses. So basically we are the best in user acquisition, but we just to, uh, want to acquire 1 million more users. Okay, let's, so, let's connect and talk. You, you are a bit, a little bit early for our fund because we do require higher uh, revenues uh, to invest, but let's talk, let's connect, let's look into the, the model and everything else, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll go forward from there. Okay, yeah, fine, thank you. Duran, you on? Yeah, can, can you tell me exactly how was the $600,000 allocated? Uh, it's my, uh, so basically it, uh, we are very efficient in uh, user acquisition. So we spent not more than 100,000 on marketing but, and uh, all the other stuff was, uh, uh, it's basically development uh, because we rolled out like uh, th in three iterations and uh, we became the re recruiting platform uh, only this year. We have a team of uh, four developers, uh, it's two, uh, 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 to front enders and to backend uh, developers. So, how much cash is on on, on hand? Uh, to have uh, our run rate is three months. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Great, thanks so much. And the final pitch of the day. Finally, we reached this milestone of the year, <laughs> like that. <laughs> and. Uh, what, really, that's a lot of that's a lot of pressure there. You know, final pitch of the year. You know, you, you better be good. <laughs> <laughs> I should be. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, I'm just gonna start and say I am William Tetwa, founder of Happy Hope Dweller. Um, the biggest problem that we're experiencing here, uh, in terms of farmers, is the post harvest losses, low incomes, lack of financial inclusion, reduced productivity adjacent um, services. So we as Happy Hope Dweller are working on developing an e-commerce marketplace that will assist to reduce the post-harvest. Uh, Hello? Did we lose them? I think so, we lose them. Yeah. Okay, maybe we just give it another try. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> So the final pitch was almost like oh, no. Yeah, um, it just <laughs> I am really, really surprised. To, uh, <laughs> but by the way, I think I saw this pitch uh, the other uh, on on the first event. Yeah, uh, we, yeah. We've, we've we've seen this before. Okay, so before uh, before uh, this person tries to reconnect, uh, we just give him another minute. Uh, I just want to say. 
thank you so much to uh, all the hard work uh, all entrepreneurs have done here. It's really uh, important what you're doing and the impact you create, you're creating the world in the world. So we created the space for you with investors and you did a great job. Of course, some investors were, or some startups were at the early stage, some at later stage. You don't have uh, strict criteria in here, unlike, uh, unlike other program we have, pitch to global investors, so definitely apply there. And uh, I thank uh, every investor for uh, doing so, so great job giving feedback. <laughs> Little fight in here and uh, uh, soft commitments is, is just uh, amazing what's happening here. So uh, do you think we should continue waiting? Um, I think uh, I think it's time to wrap it up. Yeah, we can close out. Yeah, I guess uh, I guess this is the time. Just one second. All right. So, guys, um, I want to say thank you to all the startups. Uh, not only uh, today, but uh, the entire year was amazing for global, global world. We uh, we are growing exponentially, and uh, not even revenue wise, but we are uh, we are creating impact in many countries. And uh, I I'm really grateful for everyone participating in this because we are giving a chance to everyone to get connected, the, the access to network, access to knowledge, and access to opportunity to raise capital like today. So, uh, uh, and for that, I thank investors for participating. And before I do a closing uh, statement for this year. Uh, I want to give the floor to you, investors. Uh, please uh, say your final words to entrepreneurs, uh, maybe some words of wisdom or recommendations, wherever you want to share based on today's uh, talk or maybe just uh, wrap this uh, year up, uh, wherever it was. Uh, Daniel, sorry to disturb the apologies. My network was just a bit slow there. Can I just chip in there uh, for the final few minutes there? Uh, Let's not try again. Too much time. Okay. Perfect. You, Thanks. You as mentioned, my name is William Tetwa. Um, I am founder and managing director of Happy Hope Dweller. Um, the biggest problems of, uh, smallholder farmers are experiencing at this point is post-harvest losses, low incomes, lack of financial inclusion, reduced productivity and adjacent services. So what we are trying to do as Nyambozi Corporation, we are developing an e-commerce marketplace to reduce post-harvest losses using e-commerce and also uh, data science. We are currently competing in a market that was capped at about 10 billion um, US dollars in South Africa alone. We are similar to Hello Choice and also Twigger Foods. However, our four main advantages are um, we are going to integrate SMS and email gateway services, uh, payment gateways, shipping gateway integrations, and also data science, small drone uh, delivery systems, small uh, drone uh, feeding systems for your livestock, and also smart bands to actually get health insights in terms of your cattle, basically. So we currently do have a retail subsidiary. Um, however, we are looking for financial backing so that we can not only grow this um, venture, but also scale our business model. There's a huge uh, uh, potential of growth to not only create jobs, but also make money. So we're looking to obviously get at least about $500,000, basically in terms of uh, this venture. Um, yeah, I think that's Thank about you. it. Thank you. That's Thanks. Okay, and this is the final pitch of the year. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Do you guys have any questions to this founder? So I have some advice, and, and this, mm -hmm. this will lead into my closing statement, so mm -hmm. I can give my, give my, my it's, it connects to my closing statement and yield it to my other comrades here. And we'll, I mean, we can close out. So you started <clears throat> talking about one product that you have, and then you mentioned other verticals that you can go into. Then you utilize a term like subsidiary. And it probably would be best for you to really focus on like the one thing that you're offering. <clears throat> now, I've always told entrepreneurs, be as creative as you want. Think big, but operate narrowly. So I'm not telling you not to focus on other ideas, but when you're pitching to investors, we have to know how we can get our like, wet our beak, where we want to stick our teeth in. And when I heard you start talking about other verticals, I didn't, I didn't even understand which vertical you were focusing on first. Then you utilize a term like subsidiary, then it, it turned into like Wall Street. So <laughs> yes. I, would, I would suggest that you focus solely on the thing that you're offering, and then you can utilize language as towards the end. Hey, that's our product so far. 
I'll take some questions from you investors. We also have an opportunity that allow us to go into different verticals. After the question, I can communicate those to you guys if you are interested. Perfect. Thank you so yeah. much. Um, and, 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 and lastly, before you speak, to all of the, the, the founders, I'll just say great job. It's not always that easy talking to investors, yeah. asking these uh, complex questions. Make sure you, you actually communicate to us exactly what you're attempting to raise. Don't underestimate your ability to get a check like today. Like don't un un underestimate that. So communicate to us what you're attempting to raise. Also, know your numbers. I know you all heard this on Shark Tank. Please know your numbers. Yeah, There's yeah, yeah, 20, yeah. Like a $10 million, $10 million revenue just doesn't fall out of the sky. I like what, what Zamir was mentioning earlier as far as the steps to get there. But overall, I love any entrepreneur that has the confidence to come and speak in front of investors. I, I'll close on that. Thank you so Thank much. You so much. Um, just to uh, mention, Duran, the only reason I actually mentioned our subsidiary is just to show that uh, we are in e-commerce and we are having traction within you know, that sphere. So as you know, um, slingshot or moving or pivoting into every e-commerce is without a doubt going to be financially viable. So it's only to highlight the fact that, you know what, already we have a subsidiary that's actually having traction. However, because we see this problem within, you know, smallholder farmers and within, you know, our market, we see an opportunity to pivot and to move into, you know, agriculture, basically, which is something that's so pivotal at this point in terms of food security, uh, which can be profitable, basically. Thank so so um, that's only the reason why I mentioned that, um, Duran. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right. And uh, that was your final uh presentation thank you so much so uh, uh dear investors the floor is yours your final statement durant you just uh, have done your statement uh, uh zamir and yuan uh, please go for it sure well first of all you know thank you again uh daniel and the whole uh ggw team for hosting the event so you guys are doing a great job of you know creating this community of founders from all over the world and i'm uh, always impressed by the geography of the startups and the diversity that we see. I, I think it's, it is important to have diversity uh, in, in our startup ecosystem. But what I want to tell and address to the founders that remain here is, and I recently posted this uh, online, uh, whenever you start fundraising, you will hear a lot of no's. You will hear maybe 50, 60, 70 no's before you hear your first yes. So, you know, don't drop... Uh, your energy, don't feel disappointed, don't think that you're doing something wrong. It's a lot of times that us as investors, we don't have that vision as you do, or we might be wrong about, uh, uh, you know, your chances of success. Just keep going forward, you know, listen to the feedback, try to uh, make your pitch, you know, more, more precise, more solid, you know, with more numbers, with more data supporting it, but keep going. That's what I want to tell you, you know, this year was pretty hard for a lot of people, especially the ones that come from, you know, the New East region of the world because of the war and everything. So I want to wish everybody peace. I want to wish everybody, you know, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year's. And uh, I want to, um, you know, just you know, tell you that, it's all about the founder's motivation to succeed. You know, you will pivot many, many times in your journey. Maybe your original idea will change dramatically and you will not recognize it. But as long as you keep moving forward, there will be people who will believe in you, you know, invest in you and support you on that journey. So good luck to everybody. Thanks again for having us. Uh, and uh, as usual, you know, uh, happy to work with Daniel and his team. Thank you. And one, one more quick point. I want to follow something Zamir said. Also, it just may not fit the nature of the portfolio of those investors. So if we have a fund of $10 million and we know we can only invest in nine companies, we're looking for the companies that may be prepared to return that $10 million in a certain time. So again, I, I really love this Zamir mentioned it because you don't want to measure your entire company by one experience from a few investors because they may love your idea just mathematically, it just may not work out to fit their current portfolio. And then you have some firms that just have money falling out of the sky. Tim Draper is one of those people. He just invests if you make him, if you get him a drink and he may invest in your company. But it's, it's, it's a very heuristic process, even on the investor side, because the reality of it is for the, for the investors that raise other funds, we are managing other people's money to invest in you. So we have to have a similar mindset of understanding how to return money to those limited partners. So it's a bit of a dance, but it's worked it in the long run because there's nothing greater than that liberation of, of, of starting a company. That was all. 
Thank you. Yeah, yeah. That, was, that, that was a great point. I, I say, you know, like a lot of companies I, I saw today wouldn't fit into our scope, but I'm happy to be a customer, you know. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really glad I had, had an opportunity, first time to be here. So I really enjoyed uh, all the conversations today. It feels like such a pleasure. You know, I was really excited to see a lot of, you know, really interesting uh, founders and projects. And um, and and I think my, what I want to uh, maybe bring up is um, sometimes it's really important to get the investor inside, excited, but that's only one side of that story, right? Like, you know, like when you're throwing throwing out an astronomical number, it, it might not get people like excited, but I, actually like it raised more questions, like how, how, how realistic is that, right? Like, and also... Uh, uh, I, I, I would recommend like, you know, sometimes uh, not just focus on the good things, but also like, you know, when, when, in, when an investor raises a concern, it's better to directly address that than like downplay it or not directly answering those questions. And some other times, like, you know, I, I think it's really, it's really not nice to see like, you know, a lot of the startups are, you know, having, you know, get, get, getting traction, getting investors. But sometimes when you say like, you know, things like, you know, Time, times, you know, we're, we're closing really soon, like times, you know, passing, like it's your last chance. It kind of feels like it might come across as sometimes like, you know, a uh, sales tactic to, to certain people. And that just might not fly well to like every single uh, investor. I feel like, you know, pitching is difficult because sometimes you have to kind of get the audience, like kind of get a feel like, you know, what they're looking for and what kind of, you know, personality they have. Uh, but, uh, you know, I guess that, that also comes to the, you know, you know the subject, the subjective kind of a, a part of the evaluation, right? So like, I think that was really interesting, but um, yeah, but I said, you know, as, as everybody else had already said, pitching is kind of a grueling, difficult uh, journey and you, you're going to hear a lot of no's, but, you know, it, it, at the end of the day, like, you know, you have to believe in yourself first and, uh, and have that conviction to like carry yourself through. So I really appreciate everybody's energy today. Thank you so much for this words. Really appreciate that. Uh, my closing statement is very short. Many entrepreneurs are coming to me saying like, okay, connect me with this and that entrepreneur. So I'll, uh, I'll do something like uh, I'll make you a reward for that. And so, uh, or just will, will this platform help you to raise us capital? So I would say no. Uh, it's not uh, exactly uh, working like this. What I can do, I can show you the way. I can uh, show you the right people. I can bring you to the right environment because this exactly ecosystem is built where entrepreneurs can meet the right investors and uh, we're making it closer for you to, uh, uh, to, to meet the investors. And we're try, trying to make it sure that you're meeting the right investors. Today, that was a little general, but uh, we managed to listen a lot of entrepreneurs. And uh, uh, the other program we have, which to Global Investors, is a very precise, very selective program. So apply. It's on our website. So I want to say thank you to all for all your hard work, for the projects you do. To me, when I started this company, uh, I started this uh, uh, to create an impact, to really help entrepreneurs. And I think after three years, this company exists. I see that uh, we help entrepreneurs not only in Silicon Valley, because Silicon Valley is really good with uh, connections and resources and everything, but those who really lack connections, they don't have as many opportunities or access to capital. That is why we have entrepreneurs, not only in the US, but all around the world, and they are making a change. And according to Crunchbase, by the way, they believe that by 2035, there will be 75% of unicorns outside the United States. So you guys are doing a great job and some of you will, uh, might become a unicorn soon. This is what I wish everyone. I wish uh, you, you and all your families happiness, success, and of course, peace. This year was hard. And uh, I wish everyone a Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and let's be connected. After this call, after this video, I want everyone to fill in the evaluation form. Give us feedback. If you don't like us, tell us this. Tell us what is exactly you don't like and we'll change. We want this event to be useful. Uh, uh, to the point and achieving the results. Thank you and have a great the rest of your day, the rest of the week and the rest of the year. Take care guys. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.